for us to kick off this year's Android Dev Summit. And to start off, we have another episode of The Android Show with me, your host, Carrie Byron. This year's summit is all about building excellent apps across devices. And coming up in today's keynote, you'll get a peek into the world of Team Android, our very own Android Avengers and the tools that they're building to help developers heed the call to restore order and stability to apps across the Android-verse. Speaking of which, I've created a Team Jetpack superhero alter ego of my own. From now on, you can refer to me as Captain Curiosity, traveling down YouTube rabbit holes at the speed of, why? Um, uh, Houston? We may have a compilation error. Uh, Team Jetpack. Can I get a little help over here? Team Jetpack. Assemble! Let's do this. That's more like it. Yeah! I helped. Whoa! That was wild! Heck yeah! Hey, let me keep the laser glove! All right, so coming up, we'll be hearing about how to build excellent apps using the latest tools in modern Android development, like Compose, as well as the latest news on updates to help you extend your app across devices to new form factors. But first, Kicking off this keynote, we'll hear from Sagar, who will share with you some of the updates on where the Android team is headed this year. And it all starts right now, right here, from our fortress of Coditude. Oh, you're my hero. <laughs> oh my God, it's cold. Mm. Better. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us today at the 2021 Android Dev Summit. I hope you and your loved ones are staying safe and the team and I are really looking forward to the day we could all meet again in person. I wanted to give a special hello to our GDE and GDG communities and women tech maker ambassadors who are championing Android and joining us from around the world. While the last year and a half has brought many challenges, one of the bright spots has been seeing the way developers like you have responded. The app experiences that you build have helped people around the world in ways we couldn't have imagined. Let's take a look at a few apps created by Android developers in our community. Starting with Gaston Sayen and Android GDE from Cordoba, Argentina. Gaston created a food delivery app called Ulala that enables users to get food delivered to their loved ones all over Argentina. 
Joe Birch from the UK built an accessible guitar to help the mute, deaf, and blind learn to play the guitar using a combination of a built-in speaker, screen, and a braille reader. And Kushbu Agarwal started an Indian healthcare startup called Zyla, which provides personalized care to patients with chronic illnesses. Kushbu, Gaston, and Joe are great examples of focusing on the user, understanding their needs, and then building experiences to delight them. This spirit is what drives us at Google and our work on Android. At the end of the day, our goal is to build a platform that we and all of you love to use every day, and one that billions of people around the world will also love. We're very excited about the advancements we made this year on Android. With Android 12, we've taken a user-first design approach that is centered all around you. Smartphones are deeply personal, and Android 12 helps the entire phone adapt to you with Material U design language. It's the biggest design change in Android's history where we've rethought the entire experience, from the colors, to the shapes, to the light and motion. The result is a more expressive, dynamic, and personal experience than ever before. We'll share some news on how you as developers can use this in just a bit. Android 12 also focuses on security by default, and that's part of a much larger investment across Android and Play in the security, safety, and trust space. With this release, we introduced Android's private compute core, PCC, an open source secure environment that is isolated from the rest of the operating system and apps, powering critical features such as smart reply, live caption, and now playing. We'll also continue to increase our investment in Google Play Protect, which now scans over 100 billion apps every day for potential risks. Over the past couple of years, we've continued to give users more controls and transparency when installing or using an application. Our next step will be the launch of a new data safety section in Google Play that informs a user of what data is collected and why before they install an app. All of us have a critical responsibility to our users to maintain their trust. When they are happy, we all succeed. Another big theme for us on Android is helping all of your devices work better together. Based on all of your feedback, we've recognized there's more we can do to help experiences that extend beyond the phone to an entire ecosystem of devices, including wearables, TVs, and cars. I'll share just a few examples of our efforts from the last few months. Today, one out of three smartphone users have a fitness tracker or smartwatch. Recognizing that, we have taken our collaboration with Samsung and mobile to the next level and launched an entirely new version of Wear OS. We also brought richer, more immersive app experiences to Wear OS with Google Play, YouTube Music, Google Pay, Spotify, Strava, Calm, and much, much more. And on TV, we have just launched one of our most requested features to date. Your Android phone has remote control features built in that can now be used for any of your Google TV or Android TV devices. We have also made major improvements to Android Auto for you to stay on track during your drive, including support for more app categories like navigation, EV charging, and parking. Finally, over the past 18 months, we've seen people around the world buy and use Android tablets, Chrome OS devices, and foldables more than ever before. In fact, there are over 250 million active large screen Android devices. And last year, Chrome OS grew 92%, five times the rate of the PC market, making Chrome OS the fastest growing desktop OS. With schools being online and individuals working from home, having a large screen device that's easier to use for extended periods of time is essential. We'd like to thank all of you who have invested in making your apps work great on large screens. And we've also heard your feedback that you want us to go bigger on Android with large screens. So I've already said, Android 12 is one of our biggest releases in history. But today I'm excited to announce we're going even bigger. We're adding additional support for large screens in Android 12. Diana will be joining in a bit to share more details on this news. With that, I want to kick it over to my team, who will be focusing on two big themes today. First, excellent apps, and the updates to our modern Android development offering to help you stay more productive so you can focus on building great applications. And second, helping you extend those apps across devices 
As users want to experience the apps you all build on all the form factors they use on a daily basis. Once again, thank you so much for joining us today, for building amazing experiences, and for inspiring us to make Android better every single day. My name is Moi Adeyemi, and I am a software engineer at Twitter and the Android tech lead for the search team. I'm also an Android GDE. I studied computer science with maths, um, and I learned a bit of programming fundamentals there. But my curiosity wasn't fully picked until I saw some apps that my friends built, and I wanted to learn how to build that too. Being an Android GDE means that I now have a broader platform to contribute to the Android developer community. For modern Android development, the three things I use the most are Kotlin, Android Studio, and Compose. I started using Kotlin in 2017, some months before it became announced at Google I.O. as the official language for Android development. I remember that I was very excited about that announcement that I gave a talk at the Google I.O. Extended event in Lagos, introducing other developers to Kotlin. I love Kotlin because it's a lot less verbose. I like that immutability and null safety checks are built in and it's a lot more fun to work with. One of my favorite features of Android Studio is the layout inspector. I like it because sometimes I need to make changes to another portion of the code base that my team doesn't own. And because of the size of the code base here, it's difficult to know sometimes exactly what classes you need to change. With the layout inspector, I can easily get an ID for one of the elements and that reduces the amount of time I need to search. I've been using Compose in my personal projects for a while now because it reduces the amount of time required to create a new project and because we no longer need to have separate XML files. In Compose, I'm most excited about the lazy row slash column feature which has replaced the recycler view and drastically reduced the amount of complexity required to work with dynamic lists. Some teams at Twitter are already using Compose in production, and I am excited for more teams to start using it too. Hi, I'm Florina. When it comes to helping you build excellent apps, many of the best ideas on the Android team come from talking directly with you, our community of developers understanding how you work and how we can make our tools and services even better so you can be more productive and focus on expressing your ideas. We called our expanding collection of development tools, APIs, language and distribution technologies Modern Android Development, MAD for short, and is the combination of 10 years of building Android developer tools and best practices. It's opinionated and powerful for fast, easy development, enabling you to create better apps that run across billions of devices. Modern Android development starts with great programming language support, Kotlin. Officially supporting Kotlin is an example of an investment that came directly from listening to the community. You love it? We love it? I love it. Today, of the top 1,000 apps, 87% contain Kotlin code, and even more, 40% use coroutines, our recommended solution for asynchronous work. New this year, we have our Lifecycle Aware Coroutines APIs, which are now stable. Use Repeat on Lifecycle and Flow with Lifecycle to stop collecting from the UI when it's not needed. But we're not stopping here. We're working on expanding our guidance on coroutines, flows, and app architecture. Kotlin Symbol Processing, KSP, our replacement for Kotlin Annotation Processing Tool, KAPT, is now stable. KSP offers similar functionality to KAPT, but with faster compilation time and direct access to Kotlin language constructs. Room saw two times improvement in compilation time when switching to KSP, and we're working on moving Dagger and Hilt to it as well. Our latest Jetpack libraries are built from the ground up using Kotlin. And one of the most exciting libraries right now is Jetpack Compose, Android's new modern native UI toolkit to help you build better apps faster. Compose is stable and ready for use in production. We build Compose to interoperate with your existing apps, and it's been exciting seeing the community adopting it so quickly. In fact, we're already seeing thousands of apps on the Play Store using Compose. Even the Play Store itself uses it. It's incredible seeing developers' reaction after working with Compose. They're telling us how easily they can create beautiful apps quickly. 
and how simple it is to add features like animations. Square's experience resonates with how I felt when I started using Compose. They told us, sometimes it's almost so simple, you expect it to be more complicated. Things just work. We're working to expand Compose support across all form factors, starting with home screen widgets and Wear OS. More on Compose and Wear OS later. We've been busy since the 1.0 release, building in the open and talking with you to ensure we're solving your problems. Today, Compose 1.1 goes better with a range of performance improvements, new features, and tooling. We continued expanding the APIs with features like lazy layout animations, stretch over scroll for Android 12, improved touch target sizing, and more. We've added faster refresh for live edits to live literal values, so your changes show up on device, emulator, or preview as you type. We've also added Compose support to Android Studio's Layout Inspector, adding Compose-specific features like inspecting the semantics tree. But we're not done yet. We have so many features planned. Check out the public roadmap to see what's coming next. Now, we want to show you how this looks like in action. So over to Nick for a demo. Thanks, Florina. Here's an app we've been working on to create our own Jetpack Heroes. The UI is entirely made with Jetpack Compose, so it's been fast and easy to build. But don't just take my word for it. Let me show you how. For example, I've been wanting to see a list of our hero friends and all the Android dev superpowers. We can quickly iterate on an individual list item using Android Studio's preview. Here I have three previews of this friend item, allowing us to see it in light and dark themes and with a larger font. Compose previews can display near real-time updates of literal values. I can change padding values and the image size and see them update immediately. This works both on the device and in the preview. Live editing of literals produces a really fast iteration cycle, keeping me very productive. When I'm happy with an individual list item, Compose makes it so, so easy to display a list of items. To build our list of friends, we can use the lazy column composable to call our friends composable in an items block. And that's it. No more layouts, adapters, and view holders to manage. Well, one of my absolute favorite things about Compose is how much easier animations are to write. I want the items in this list to animate in. I can simply wrap the list in an animated visibility composable, which will animate the entire list entrance. I can also use the animated enter exit modifier on individual items. And here, let's add a staggered animation. I can switch my list to use items index to give me the index of each item. And then in the modifier, use this index to customize the slide in entrance animation. And like this, each item will enter from further out and then come together. Let's take a look in the experimental animation inspector. We can play back and scrub through the entire transition. Pretty nice. Compose also uses spring-based animations by default, so it's easy to configure the animation to add a slight bounce by reducing the damping. Hopefully this shows how marvelous Compose is for making you feel super productive. Over to Andre to tell us more about Material U. Material U is a radical new design vision focused on delivering experiences that are personal for every style, accessible for every need, and adaptive for every screen. Starting today with Jetpack Compose, realizing this vision is even easier. In Android 12, the Material U experience is front and center. From the spirited shapes of the new widgets to the expressive use of motion and large type on the home screen, the updated visual design is fresh, alive, and original. The days of one size fits all are long gone. People are eager to express their individuality and are seeking more personalized experiences in everyday life. For me, the most exciting thing about moving into a new home is going to the paint store and finding that color that will best represent my style and make me smile when I unlock the door. And when I get a new phone, the first thing I do is set my wallpaper. And so do about 60% of Android users. I typically choose some abstract art or a photo of my dog, something personal. By building a dynamic color palette from a device wallpaper, Material U creates a tailored experience that's reflective of the user's personality and applies it thoughtfully throughout their Android device experience. To get a feel for apps that support dynamic color, 
let's take a look at how we've applied it to the updated Google Apps. The Gmail, Calendar, and Calculator apps are great examples of how we can maintain the recognizability of the apps and keep them feeling unique. We've updated the styling and improved the accessibility of our navigation components with new state indicators and color mappings so your apps can be optimized to reach more people on more devices. Now that you've seen what apps with dynamic color feel like, let's talk about how to make them. Today, we're releasing a new version of our Material Components libraries for Android Views and a preview of our Material Use Support and Jetpack Compose, which will help you quickly and easily create amazing personalized app experiences. All of the updated components, design guidelines, and developer documentation can be found on the new Material Design 3 microsite at material.io. We understand this is a new way of thinking of color. In order to support your team, we're releasing Material Theme Builder, a new tool to visualize dynamic color in your app designs. With its built-in code export, it's easy to migrate to Material's new color system and take advantage of dynamic color. Material Theme Builder is available as a web tool and Figma plugin, which you can use today. All of these great Material U features are already available on Pixel devices with Android 12, and we're excited to roll it out to more devices in the Android ecosystem soon. Back to Nick to see this in action. Ah, uh, Material Design and Compose, two of my absolute favorite things, teaming up to make it fast and easy to build beautiful Material U apps. I've got just the friend that can help update our app. Let me get an assist from our designer, Yasmin. Hey, Yas. Hey, Nick. I saw the Material Design logo in the sky and came as fast as I could. I've been playing around with the Material Theme Builder and seeing how dynamic color may look within our app. I didn't know there was so much color in the whole galaxy. Applying dynamic color is going to give our app the extra boost it needs. But first, we need to migrate our themes to Material Design 3 to take advantage of all these beautiful colors. Let's create a custom theme. We can use the primary container color to highlight primary actions like this fab, which is now over 50% more fabulous, and use tertiary container color to heighten attention to an element, such as these power boosts. This is looking great. With its built-in code export, Nick can easily implement the new Material 3 theme and ensure dynamic color maps beautifully across our UI. Nick, are you ready to implement this? Yes. After adding the Material 3 alpha dependency to our app, we can update our theme composable to work with dynamic color. We'll use dynamic color when running on Android 12, or at least S, and update our theme logic to use dynamic dark or light color scheme functions to retrieve a color scheme extracted from the device's wallpaper. And that's it. That's all I have to do to update my theme to use dynamic colors. The updated Material 3 components use these colors, so depending on the device's wallpaper, then the app gets completely different feel to go with it. Now, in the Material U videos, I noticed a fun wiggling slider. Well, this isn't part of a Material 3 library. This is Compose. Let's build it. I can fork the slider component and alter the rendering logic to draw a wiggly path instead of a straight line. What's more, Compose makes it super easy to even animate this. Let's alter the path using Remember Infinite Transition to add a wiggle. And we can see this right here in Studio in the interactive preview. Material U has made our app more personal and more fun. Back to you, Flo. Now to my personal favorite, Jetpack. We've been working to add the features you've been asking us for. Navigation brings multiple backstack support. No code update needed. Just make sure you use the latest version. Work Manager, our recommended solution for persistent work, makes it easier to handle Android 12 background restrictions, adding support for expedited jobs. And Room adds auto-migration and multi-map relations. All right, now that I've got the mic, let me go deeper in Room auto-migrations. The most common database operations can be handled out of the box, like adding columns or tables or primary keys. All you have to do is add an auto-migration definition. For some changes, like renaming a column or a table, you'll have to lend Room a hand and implement an auto-migration spec. So you write four lines of code, not just one. OK, I can talk about Room all day, but let me tell you what's in store for two of our newer libraries, Data Store. Our coroutine-based replacement for shared preferences has reached 1.0. 
whether you prefer preferences data store to store key value pairs or proto data store to store typed objects, you will use Coffin coroutines and flow to store data asynchronously, consistently and transactionally. So now that data store reached 1.0, start using it in production. Macro benchmark a tool to measure and improve startup and frame performance, edit simplified and more accurate frame timing, and compatibility back to Android M. Finally, because we know that understanding your app's performance is important, we added support for profilable APKs in Android Studio to help you measure timings more accurately without the performance degradation of debuggable apps. Whew, so from Material U and Compose to the latest Jetpack libraries, that was a lot of modern Android development features to help you be productive, building excellent apps for your users. Now, back to you, Kari. Thanks, Florina. Wow, all those updates to Compose and Android mean more apps that are, in fact, excellent. So while Team Compose was showing off their new bug blasters, I've been busy building a little gadget of my own. Check out the Carry 9000. Time for a beta test. Huh, still working out the um, bugs. <laughs> anyway, we'll check back with Nick and Yasmin in a bit. Plus chat with Diana about how Android is helping developers build excellent apps across any device including large screens and foldables. But first, our friends at Spotify will share with us how they've used Android to optimize their apps for wearables, large screens, and more. Hmm. Looks like we're gonna need a bigger power supply. Wait, I have a laser glove. Throughout recent decades, technology has made music more and more accessible. It feels so strange to like hold the medium in your hand like this. It's so retro. With the technology advances that we've been seeing, we're moving closer to our mission. We want our users to be able to listen wherever they are, whatever they're doing. That's why with Google, we've developed a seamless experience across screen sizes and devices. We have a design paradigm that we call Adaptive UI, modeled after Google's material design. This allows us to build for any shape and size of screen, so users have a completely uninterrupted listening experience. One great example is Spotify with Android Auto. To build Spotify for the car, we've had to balance the rich listening experience against our user's safety. Playing the album uplifting songs on Spotify. The ability for the user to ask the assistant to play anything they want is truly unique. Combined with Spotify's best-in-class understanding of what the user likes to listen to makes the experience truly special. We pride ourselves on knowing your musical taste better than you do. Ubiquity is a really important principle for Spotify, making sure users' audio is available in every moment of their life. No matter if you're listening from your mobile device, the speaker in your home, TV, gaming console, Wear OS allows you to change what you're listening to directly from your wrist, tying the Spotify ecosystem together. Technology has changed over the decades, and that's made music and audio more accessible than ever. We're finding a new level of human creativity where people are able to express themselves in ways that we couldn't have imagined a few decades ago, and that's a very exciting place to be. A user's digital life includes multiple connected devices, and they expect all of their apps to transition seamlessly between them. Like we saw with Spotify, truly exceptional app experiences are no longer about developing for a single device, but across devices, building for the entire Android ecosystem. We are making it easier than ever to extend your app across form factors, with some big announcements to unfold today. But first, Let's talk about how Android is thriving across auto, TV, wearables, and more. Android Auto is now available in over 100 million cars and is supported by nearly every major car manufacturer. Our newest in-car experience, Android Automotive OS, will be available on cars from top brands including Ford, General Motors, Renault, Volvo Cars, and most recently announced, Honda. To support this growing ecosystem, we recently introduced the Android for Cars app library, which allows developers of navigation, 
EV charging, and parking apps to bring these capabilities to Android for Cars. We're also excited about the growth for the Android TV OS, which now has more than 80 million monthly active devices globally. As Sagar mentioned, to help phones work better together with TVs, we've built remote control features for Android TV apps directly into Android phones and through the Google TV app. It's a great time to integrate your media apps with the Android TV OS. And when it comes to wearables, at I.O., we announced the launch of the new Wear OS, and it's become the platform's most anticipated release ever. The new Wear OS, powered by Samsung, has since launched on the Galaxy Watch 4 series with great success. Many developers have created helpful experiences for the latest version of Wear OS, and we're looking forward to richer, more immersive app experiences like what we're seeing from Strava, Spotify, and Calm. And they're already seeing higher engagement with these apps. Now on Wear OS, tiles are enabled for devices like the Galaxy Watch 4, providing predictable, glanceable access to information and quick actions. Take this example from Calm, giving users more entry points to access their app. The API is in beta for you to try out now. You asked for more modern Android development, and we're now making it easier than ever to develop on Android's smallest screen. Compose makes building UIs so much faster and easier. So we're bringing Compose support to Wear OS. You can design your app with familiar UI components adapted for the watch. After several alpha releases, we're now in a full developer preview with new samples and documentation to help you get started. Try it out and give us your feedback before we finalize APIs during beta. Even more modern Android, we've also been working on new Jetpack APIs and capabilities, like support for curved text and new health services. With these are a set of Kotlin first APIs rewritten from the ground up. These are going to beta and stable, so the time to migrate to them is now. In partnership with Samsung, there's a new watch face studio, which enables you to create watch faces in a WYSIWYG editor. So watch you see is watch you get. Lastly, we're making it even easier for people to discover and download your Wear OS apps when they open Google Play. We've added a new watch face search filter and category pages, allowing people to browse specifically for watch faces. We'll also be introducing Wear OS specific ratings and reviews to give users a better impression of the experience on a watch. Finally, we're making our biggest ever investment in our large screens, such as foldables, tablets, and Chrome OS. We're incredibly excited about the innovation happening on foldables. They're redefining the future of mobile devices with new models from partners like Samsung, Microsoft, Xiaomi, and Motorola. We've seen more than a two and a half increase in device sales this year, and it's easy to see why. Foldables put the power of a tablet right in your pocket. Speaking of tablets, usage in the home and at work has transformed in recent years, with an almost 20% increase in tablet sales that has continued throughout 2021. Users are doing more than ever on tablets, spending almost 10% more time than they did in 2019. Chrome OS grew 92% year over year, making it the fastest growing desktop OS in the world. With over 250 million active large screen devices, it's so important to ensure your app works across any size screen in any orientation. Large screen UIs present an opportunity to extend your existing phone app so users can see and do more. This is important for our own apps, such as Google Photos. We updated the Google Photos app to work well on large screens and saw an improvement in daily active users by as much as 53% for key features. It's time to break away from designing for a 16 by nine portrait phone app and start building UI responsively. To help with that, we're releasing new features to make it easier for you to support large screens. Adopting Compose is a perfect opportunity to make your UI fully adaptive. All UI is described in code, and it's easy to make decisions at runtime about how your UI should look. No more reliance on resource qualifiers. We are releasing Material U navigation component support and implementations of large screen layouts and sample apps to help you understand how modern UI development should scale across screen sizes. We've heard from you that knowing what screen sizes to develop and design for is hard. 
So our new window size classes are an opinionated set of viewport breakpoints that will tell you what sizes are the most common, from phone to foldable, tablet, and desktop. You'll see these size classes across our design guidance and as APIs in Jetpack Window Manager 1.1. You'll also see new reference devices in Android Studio that make it easy for you to develop against all combinations of window size classes. There are many more updates from support for new features like rear camera selfies in Jetpack Window Manager 1.1 to added testing capabilities and Gradle Manage device testing in Studio. Let's see how it all works in practice. To see how our app looks on larger screens, I'm going to switch to the new resizable emulator. This makes it easy to toggle between different display sizes without having to juggle multiple emulators. Looking at our app on foldable or tablet, we're not taking advantage of the extra space. Yas, can we update our designs to be more responsive? Material Design offers a number of adaptive design patterns that can work for us. Let's switch our bottom navigation bar to the navigation rail on larger screens to make it easier to reach. Also, I think we can use the list detail view pattern on the front screen to show more at once. Compose combined with Jetpack Window Manager makes it easy to observe the device's window size class or folded state. I can then update my UI in response. For example, I've created a top level scaffold to switch between showing bottom navigation bar on narrow screens and the navigation rail on wider screens. We can check the window size class and arrange things with rows or columns accordingly. We can show the friends list and the friends detail composables side by side in the expanded width state. We can even animate this change simply by animating the weight given to each pane. Composables encourage you to create reusable pieces of UI that are easier to rearrange or combine at runtime using Kotlin control flow. It's also much easier for individual composables to respond to the space they're given, like this screen, which switches from a list to a grid of sliders on wider screens. I've got an idea for how we can take advantage of foldable screens here. We can observe the folded state, and in tabletop mode, we can reposition our UI to work best in this posture. Check it out, Yaz. Looks great. Moving our interactive components to the bottom of the screen will ensure we can make changes without toppling over the device on the tabletop. I can't stop folding and unfolding this. Now back over to you, Diana, to expand on large screens. When developers have adapted their apps to fill the entire screen and be fully resizable, we've seen users spend more time in the app. Zoom has taken advantage of tabletop mode on foldables for hands-free video calls and are working to optimize their UI fully for split-screen usage and larger layouts on foldables and tablets. But with all the work developers are doing for large screens, you need an OS to match. So we're going big. Today, we're releasing a developer preview of an upcoming feature drop for Android 12 with updates added just for large screens. We call it 12 out. We've been working with developers like you to understand what APIs you need and upstreaming changes from device makers that users love. 12L includes an API bump with a redesign of the OS for large screens, added multitasking support, and updated compatibility modes to make your app work better on large screens out of the box. Let's take a closer look. We have redesigned Android's UI from the ground up for large screens scaling the UI to work with any screen size, including larger tablets. An optimized home screen layout, updated lock screen, and a two-column notification shade are just some of the examples of how we elegantly transition from a folded exterior screen to a larger interior screen on a foldable. Users tell us they love multitasking on larger displays, from using split screen to doing more in apps. But we know that getting into split screen is not super discoverable today. So, We've added a new taskbar to make multitasking easier than ever. Now you can use the taskbar to switch quickly between apps, drag and drop to enter split screen, and swipe up to go back to home. We've also added more ways to enter split screen from the overview. In addition, we're helping users by automatically enabling all apps to enter split screen or multi-window mode, regardless of whether they're resizable. Even if you have yet to invest in optimizing for large screens, we've updated app compatibility modes on Android and Chrome OS. We've improved the user experience 
and we better respect the device's orientation. Letterboxing apps which don't support resizing or both portrait and landscape. With all of these changes, you should expect to see an increase in split screen usage and your app being used in windows of varying sizes. So it's important to make sure your app can adapt to this seamlessly. We're also making it simpler for apps to take advantage of the extra screen space, even if your existing application architecture still relies on multiple activities. With activity embedding coming in 12L and Jetpack Window Manager 1.1, you'll be able to display multiple activities side by side, so you don't have to re-architect your app to support list detail or other multi-pane app layouts. We're committed to making it easier to support large screen layouts through the platform and Jetpack. We've put so many features into the Android 12L feature drop. We encourage you to check it out in our developer preview dropping today on our emulator. For foldables, you'll see many of these features, including activity embedding, coming soon to the Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 3. On tablets, you'll soon be able to load the developer preview on the Lenovo P12 Pro. Take a look as we gear up for public release in early 2022. We see this as a huge step forward in our support for foldables and tablets, and we'll incorporate more features for large screens into our regular releases moving forward. To make it easier for people to find the best app experiences, we've got new changes in play to recommend apps optimized for the large screen. This includes new checks to assess app quality so we can feature large screen optimized apps and update search rankings to show the best possible apps for these devices. We'll also be introducing large screen specific app ratings so users can rate how your app works on large screens. These changes are coming in the spring, so we're giving you advance notice to get your apps ready now. Okay, there's so much for large screens. Let's do a quick recap. Available now are a bunch of developer APIs and tools to help you optimize your app for the 250 million large screen devices we have today. We're also dropping the developer preview of 12L features on the emulator. You can download it now to explore how your app will look with our upcoming updates. Soon, you'll be able to test out these features on real devices like the Lenovo P12 Pro and the Fold 3. And finally, 12L and Play Store updates will begin to ship to consumers in 2022. So get ready for the next wave of foldable and tablet devices. We're excited about this as the future of the Android ecosystem. But the best part of this is that so much of this applies to devices available right now. Expand how you're thinking about extending your app to the larger screen, try the new APIs and tools, and check out the 12L features to help you bring your app to foldables and tablets today. That's all we've got time for today on the Android Show. But we've covered a lot from Material U, now available in Compose, to Android 12, a brand new developer preview of Android for large screens and foldables. Want to learn more? You can read more at developer.android.com. So the Android show is winding down, but the Android Developer Summit is just getting started. We've just dropped over 30 technical sessions of Android developer content, so you can dig in at your own pace. Over the next two days, You've got a lot coming at you, including your opportunity to get your hashtag Ask Android questions answered live with the experts who built Android. Thanks for tuning into the Android Show. I'm Carrie Byron. Now, if you'll excuse me. You can't vlog. Take that. Hey everyone, I'm Tor Norby from the Android Studio team. And I'm Jamal, also from the Android Studio team. And today we're going to walk through what's new in the Android developers tool space. I'll be giving a demo a little later on, but first Jamal is going to cover what we've been working on recently. Today we will cover three main areas. Recent changes in Android Studio, an in-depth demo, 
And lastly, a quick wrap up to recap all that you heard today. All right, on to recent changes. First off, Android Studio Arctic Fox is currently in the stable release channel. At Google I.O. earlier this year, we spoke quite a bit about all the features in Arctic Fox. In case you forgot, this major release has three major focus areas. First off, design. This was the first stable release that included tool support for Jetpack Compose and a host of design tools and inspectors to make it easier for you to create and preview UI. Secondly, Arctic Fox included a sizable amount of features focused on Android devices, from a heart rate sensor on Wear OS to an updated Android TV emulator that supports Google TV. Lastly, but not least, there was a ton of effort on improving developer productivity with under the hood improvements and even tools for Work Manager. Now, let's take a look at Bumblebee, which you can download today in the beta release channel. In this release, you will find our initial support of Material U and more refinement in our Jetpack Compose tools. Next, we spent more time on creating features that make you more productive. And lastly, with the Bumblebee release, you can get started on scaling your app for large screens with Android 12 L. To see some of these features in action, now Tor will walk you through what's new in Android Studio. We're about to stabilize the Bumblebee release, and our next release is codenamed Chipmunk, and that's what I'll be showing you here today. So the first thing we'll do is upgrade this project to Chipmunk. And we have the AGP Upgrade Assistant to help with that. Uh, AGP is short for the Android Gradle plugin. So uh, we will just begin the upgrade and show usages. And this is going to show us what it's about to change in the project. So I can just accept the suggestions and run the import. And now my project should be upgraded to use the latest uh, version of AGP. And next, we will build the project. And once we do that, we can open up the build analyzer and look at some suggestions. And one of them is to look at the build configuration time. So if we click on optimize this and say, try configuration cache in a build, Studio will run through your build with configuration caching on, checks whether your build is compatible with configuration caching. And in this case, it is. So we can say enable configuration caching and now builds will be faster. So it basically sets this uh, environment variable right here. One thing we plan to add to the build analyzer soon is also checking whether the jetifier is necessary. Uh, for now, you can just try turning it off yourself. And uh, if the build works, that's gonna make for a faster build. Another build related feature is support for non-transitive R classes. So for that, I'm gonna switch to a larger project this is the uh, K9 mail app. And what I can do here is go to the refactoring menu and choose migrate to non-transitive R classes. This is going to analyze the whole project, find all the source files that are referencing resources, and it will rewrite them to all be project local and turn on a setting in the build system, which is going to make builds uh, be able to skip a bunch of uh, resource merging. So this helps with performance as well. And uh, definitely recommend switching to this if you have a project with lots of modules and resources. Now, the last thing I'll say about build speed is for Lint. A top request from our users has been making Lint faster uh, on your CI servers. And so in Bumblebee Canary 13 uh, and later, we now support incremental Lint tasks and caching, even remote caching. So let me show you what that means. So here's our K9 project. It's about um, 30 modules with around 100,000 lines of code uh, distributed across around 1,100 source files. And so here, because we have caching on and because I haven't made any changes to the project, if I clean the project, we can see that there are no lint reports here. If I run lint again with caching on, 
it's going to pull in those reports in just a matter of a few seconds. Now, uh, obviously, if I make a change to a file, so let's go do that. So here we will uh, change this path such that it's an SD card path. This is a new lint check. Um, sorry, this is a new uh, lint incident. So now if I run clean and lint again, so we're simulating a CI build here. Now you can see that again, it's pulling in a lot of cached results. It's only analyzing this one module that changed. And so uh, compared to the three and a half minutes this would take with older versions of lint, now we get an updated lint report in uh, 17 seconds for this project that we can look at. So while we're on the topic of performance, let's go take a look at our profilers. One of the features we're putting the final touches on now is support for helping you track down jank, which in Android refers to a UI that is not keeping up with the frame rate. So here's a trace that I've already recorded, and we can switch to the frames view. And with Android 11 and 12, we can now capture the frame lifecycle. So these are the frames in the capture, and I'm going to sort them by the duration of the time spent in the application. So it looks like frame 1748 was pretty slow. And so when I select it, you can see the frame lifecycle on the left. It's color-coded, so the purple bar here is in the application, then the same purple bar over where it's waiting for the GPU, and composition. And in fact, if we zoom out a little bit, we can also see when it's spending time on the display. And as you can see, the previous frame was on the display for quite a while. So that's our jank. So now, of course, the next step is to look at the application and render threads. We can swipe out a selection here. And now we can go and look to see what it is the application was doing to figure out what the source is of the jank. And I think in this recording, uh, we were trying to load a bunch of textures at the same time, which is what caused the jank. Okay, let's switch gears from performance to our graphical editors. So this is the camera app where the viewfinder is right here and we have some labels of the picture below it. And what we want is to have the UI rotate in place as the camera moves between landscape and portrait. And we've made that very simple with motion layout. So we have two states, the normal state for portrait and then the landscape orientation. Um, and you can see we're just rotating the controls. And if we take a look at the XML for this, all we have to do is set these constraint rotate attributes in the motion layout, and then in the manifest, lock to the portrait orientation. So let's see what that looks like. So we'll just play the transition here, and you can see that we are animating and rotating both the icon up here and the label. So let's take a look at this on a real device. So as you can see, we've embedded the emulator into Studio, it starts from snapshots in just a few seconds. Uh, we spent the year stabilizing and tuning it, and as of Bumblebee, this is now the default. So notice how when the camera is active, Studio knows that and gives us a hint about how to navigate the virtual scene. So I can now just hold the Shift key and move the camera around to the virtual scene that the emulator is presenting to the camera. The embedded emulator also has access to the full extended controls for the emulator now. So we can, for example, set a route for the navigation, or we can access virtual sensors. So for example, we can change the device pose, which is exactly what we want to do here to test our rotation. So if I start rotating the device sideways, you can see that the UI here is updating to rotate with the sensors. This is still kind of fiddly, so let's try running it on a real device. So another new feature is our device manager. We've removed our AVD modal dialog, and so we've integrated devices here. You can see our virtual devices for the emulator, as well as physical devices that I've attached through Wi-Fi pairing. So let's run this app on a real device. So as you can see here, when I rotate the phone, it smoothly animates between the rotation states. And all I had to do was set a couple of attributes in the motion layout. We're also exploring a feature to make it easier to test this within the design surface without running on a real device. If you've already seen how to play the animation in the design surface like this, well, I can also go ahead and just actually rotate the screen in place in the design surface like this. So we can actually test the animation right here while editing it. So let's take a look at a different layout. So here we have a welcome screen where we are animating in a welcome message to the center. 
So we start off off screen and then we animate it. And the top priorities for Android 12 L is handling large screens and different form factors. And one of the concepts we're adding is device classes. And so you see that we now have the various reference devices listed in the device picker. So let's switch to a tablet mode. So you can see that here, we actually start out with the welcome, the welcome message, not in fact off screen. So this animation is pretty broken for large screens. Now I found out by actually looking at the various different screen sizes. We don't really want to force you to do that. So we have this new feature that we're working on uh, called tentatively visual linting. So if I open up the problems view here, you can see that we're actually saying that we have a button which is partially hidden in layout. And so we're basically looking at different preview configurations and seeing if a view is on screen in one, it better be on screen in another as well. So let's open up the layout validation view. And so here we can see this layout across all the screen sizes. And again, if I open up the problems view, we are now uh, showing you the inconsistency right here between the two layouts. And this is not just about checking specifically for things being out of bounds. Here I'm looking at a more realistic app. This is a task tracker. And if I bring up the issues panel here, you can see that it's listing a number of issues that it has found. So again, let's open up the validation view and let's look at the uh, messages here. So for example, it tells us that we have this view inconsistency that we've already seen. It also knows that it only wants to see bottom bars in uh, narrow uh, layouts. And uh, here's an issue it's found where in really wide layouts, uh, you have text lines that are longer than 120 characters, which is not great for usability. So the key thing here is that I didn't have to go and audit all these configurations on my own. Studio is checking these things in the background and we plan to expand the set of things that we're checking beyond screen size issues. For example, we could look to see if you have uh, unexpected wrapping in certain locales and so on. Last but not least, let's talk about Compose. So we shipped full support for Compose in Arctic Fox, but in Bumblebee, we've added several new features. So first there's interactive preview. So if I go and click on this uh, icon here, the touch icon next to one of the previews, we start interactive mode. And this starts usually in under two seconds. And the key thing is now I can basically test touch handling in my app. So we're sort of running the app in the design surface and I can, uh, for example, click to open up the shopping cart. I can click to open up the menu and so on. So it lets me do some very lightweight testing of the app uh, and it's very quick to start and exit. And a very related feature to this is the support for animation inspection. So again, if I click on the animation inspection icon next to the surface, I now get this view of all the animation curves in my animation. I can scrub through the different animations or I can play them on a loop if I so choose. And so this is a pretty handy way to go through and uh, look to see how your animations are put together in case you want to adjust some of the curves. By the way, in Canary Builds, we also have these little icons uh, next to the preview annotations, the configuration picker, which makes it super easy to go and change and configure the various previews uh, for your composables. Now we know that a really important aspect of Compose is being able to iterate on the UI, uh, changing code and seeing the effects immediately. And we know that build speed is a pretty big hindrance today. So we're working on a couple of features to help with that. Uh, the first one is live editing of literals. So meaning strings, numbers, and booleans. So let's take a look at uh, this sample app. Uh, this is the Rally uh, financial app. And if I jump to uh, the alert dialog here, I can go ahead and change the text. So hello there. Notice how as I'm typing, the preview is keeping up uh, pretty much on the fly. And so this works for strings. It also works for uh, numbers. So I can, for example, change the padding to something, you know, much bigger if I want, uh, which I don't. And note that this isn't just for the preview. So now I'm running the app in the emulator and this would work on 
a physical device as well. And so I can go ahead and change. And so I can go ahead and change the text just like before. And so I can change the text just like before. I can also change numbers and I can also change Boolean. So for example, we can switch soft wrap to false, which clearly is wrong for this UI. So we'll change it back. So far, what I've shown you here are features shipping in Arctic Fox or Bumblebee or in development for Chipmunk. Now I'm going to give you a sneak peek on a couple of features we're working on for releases after that. The first one is live editing, and it's a generalization of the feature I just showed you, live editing of literals, where we let you edit uh, more general scenarios than just constants and strings. So take a look. So here in the preview, for example, I can go in and add a checkbox. And within a couple of seconds, I should see that checkbox show up in the UI. And then I can, for example, add a loop around it. And uh, now we're going to put in uh, four checkboxes into the UI and so on. And again, this is not limited to the preview. We know that for Compose development, having the embedded emulator side by side as you're testing your app logic is super useful. And we're making live editing work with that as well. So this is another app. Uh, here we are playing with Blur in Android 12. Uh, by the way, I just want to show you quickly. We support Blur in the, uh, in the layout preview as well in our uh, rendering implementation for the design time preview. Anyway, so here is our running Compose app. And I can now go in here and not just change strings as before, but I can, for example, you know, uh, comment out parts of the UI. I can reorder it. And this is basically equivalent to me typing in new things. I can change parameters uh, and so on. Uh, and you can see it basically, uh, this implementation works within milliseconds of the edits. So it's a very promising feature, but you know we learned the hard way with Instant Run that this has to be rock solid before we ship it. So we're gonna take our time and make sure that this is really right before we uh, include it in Studio, but uh, it's pretty exciting. The next feature is basically the polar opposite of what I just showed you, uh, and that's light mode. So with live editing, we are on the fly. As you're typing, we're doing lots of computations to show you the UI as fast as we can. And with visual linting, we're running analysis in the background to find potential problems in different screen sizes and so on. Light mode basically lets you say to the IDE, hey, I want you to use fewer resources uh, as I'm using the IDE. So let's take a look. So here, this is not in light mode. And you know, as I'm typing, you can see that uh, it's uh, keeping up to date. Now, if I enter light mode, and this is built on top of IntelliJ's power save mode, you can see that we now basically do not keep the UI up to date. Uh, and in fact, if I were to open up another file, um, you can see this is an XML file. We don't default to showing the split as we normally do. We just show you the source file. This is a, another Kotlin file, and in light mode, as you can see, it is not doing all the normal expensive editor validation that it normally does. You still can use go to declaration uh, and basic editor features like that, but it's not running on the fly validation, which of course uses a lot of resources. Um, and a key thing about this, so you know, if I were to write in something that is nonsensical, uh, normally this would create RUD symbols. It doesn't do that. But the key thing we've done is that if I save the file, well, then we temporarily unblock light mode so that you get the basic validation that you need. But crucially, you are staying in light mode. Uh, and so the idea here is that we are tuning all of the features in Studio to do less work uh, when suitable when you are in light mode. So for example, the layout editor is going to be uh, doing cheaper image scaling and anti-aliasing and so on, and we're, and we're disabling uh, editor features just like Power Save Mode does. So um, again, this is an uh, early exploration area, but uh, it looks pretty promising. So hopefully something will come of it. And there are, of course, many other features I wish I had time to show, such as all the new features that are part of the IntelliJ 2021.2 merge that we have now landed in Chipmunk. There's the resizable emulators for Android 12L and much, much more. But I'm now going to turn you back over to Jamal, and thank you for using Android Studio. 
Again, on top of all the tools you saw today that support phone and large screens, we still have a full suite of tools ranging from templates, Kotlin inspections, and updated emulators and more for all the Android device categories. To recap, the Bumblebee release of Android Studio has a range of features focused on Jetpack Compose, developer productivity, and large screen development. We also gave you a sneak peek at some of the features we are working on for the upcoming Chipmunk release. Download the latest updates to Android Studio today to get started. Thanks for joining Tor and myself. We look forward to all the great app experiences that you will build with Android Studio. Welcome to our Android Dev Summit session on Work Manager. My name is Ben Weiss. I'm an engineer on the Android Developer Relations team. I'm joined by Rahul Ravikumar, Work Manager's lead engineer. In this session, we're focusing on APIs and tools that we haven't talked about before in depth. You will also learn how Work Manager supports you to get back to the foreground so your app can get work done even when the user puts it in the background. But first, we're going to take a look at how and when to use Work Manager in general. From its first stable release, Work Manager provided several foundational APIs. Work Manager lets you define work, put it in a queue, run it, and let you know when it's done. Originally, work could only be run at a later point in time. With this kind of deferred execution, you're able to offload many tasks that can run at a later time. Work Manager's deferred execution respects the device and your app's standby bucket. You won't have to think about when exactly something needs to run. Just leave that to Work Manager. Because, let's be real here, in most cases, it does not matter if the sync with a remote backend happens exactly at midnight. To make this more powerful, you can constrain when your work should run. Constraints allow you to run work based on certain device states, such as when the device is idle, charging, or has access to an active network connection. This allows you to hand off checking for these conditions to Work Manager. So you can focus developing on other features instead. With Work Manager, you can also make work dependent on other work. Once data has been synchronized with the backend, you can continue to use Work Manager for clearing up your local log files or populating a database with new information. You can request work to be done in sequence or in parallel for seamless continuation of work. Work Manager will take care that all the right conditions are met and then run the next workers for you. But a backend sync is something that should happen regularly. Luckily, Work Manager not only supports one-time work, but also work that should run periodically. To make this fully transparent, you can check the status that your work is in. With this, you can see whether a worker is queued, running, blocked, or finished. These foundational APIs are available since the first stable release of Work Manager. When we first talked about Work Manager at the Android Dev Summit, we thought of it as a library for managing deferrable background work. And on a foundational level, that remains true. But since these foundations were laid, several new features were added and the API is modernized. You can now request work to be run immediately while your app is in foreground. And it will continue to run, even if your app is put in the background. So now you can also apply filters to a photo, save it locally, and then upload it, all while your users are already doing something different. Publishers of large applications have the need to optimize their resource usage even further. Work Manager is well situated here to take on the heavy lifting. With the new Work Multiprocess Library, Work Manager introduced APIs and improvements under the hood that help large-scale applications to schedule and run work in a dedicated process more efficiently. And we are aware of how important it is to test your app before shipping it to users. That's why we added APIs to enable testing single workers and entire work continuations. Also, in parallel to library releases, tooling support was improved. As developers, you now have access to detailed debug logs 
as well as inspection directly from inside Android Studio. All these new capabilities led us to rethink when to use Work Manager. While the foundational idea is still technically correct, it is a bit outdated. Because today Work Manager can do far more than that. Work Manager can now take care of any kind of work that you throw at it. So Work Manager really is a solution for all work that you want to complete. Today, we think of Work Manager as the recommended solution for persistent work. And this is what we mean by persistent work. When you think of scopes, Work Manager runs your workers in a global scope. This means your work will be around while your app is running, surviving orientation changes and other activity teardowns. But that alone is not enough for persistent work. Work Manager uses the Room database library under the hood to ensure that your work also survives process deaths as well as your device reboots. No matter the circumstances, you will always be able to recover your work status and have the possibility to continue where you left off. And work scheduled with Work Manager will be ready to go when it's your app's turn. That's what we mean by persistent work. Now over to Rahul for an in-depth tour of recent changes. Work Manager 2.3 added support for long-running work. We wanted to make it easier to run long-running work. This means work that runs longer than the 10-minute execution window that workers typically get. To make this possible, Work Manager binds the worker's lifecycle to that of a foreground service. Job Scheduler and the in-process scheduler are still aware of this work, but for all intents and purposes, the foreground service owns the execution lifecycle. Foreground services require notification to be shown to the user, so we added APIs to help with that. Users have a limited attention span, so Work Manager provides APIs to make stopping long-running work from the notification itself easy. We'll be looking at an example in more detail. Here's an example of some long-running work. We have a class download worker that extends coroutine worker. Let's define a few helper methods in our worker that will make our lives easier. Let's define a method notification which knows how to build an Android notification with the provided progress information. Next, let's define a method that does chunked downloads. This method takes an input URL, the source for the download, an output file for the destination, and a suspending callback, which gets called once per chunk with progress. The progress information in the callback can then be used to build a notification based on the previous helper. Now we can construct the foreground info instance that Work Manager needs for long running work. Foreground info is a combination of a notification ID and the notification instance. Here's where we put everything together. We have a suspending do work method. We call the chunked download method we defined earlier with the input URL and the output file. Every callback information gets some progress information. We then use this progress information to build the notification and call set foreground to show the notification to the user. Calling set foreground is what makes the worker long running. After the download is done, all the worker has to do is to return success. At this point, Work Manager decouples the execution of the worker from the foreground service automatically, cleans up notifications, and stops the service if necessary. The worker does not have to do anything to manage the service itself. Sometimes, users change their mind and want to cancel work. A running foreground service notification can't easily be swiped away. So let's talk about how Work Manager makes it easy for you to stop your worker from a notification action. Let's look at our notification helper from before. The goal here is to add a notification action that provides a signal to Work Manager to stop the worker, because that's what the user wants. The first step is to create a pending intent that makes it easy to cancel the worker. We use get ID here to get the work request ID, and then we call the create cancel pending intent API. The intent provides the cancellation signal to work manager when dispatched. Now we need to build the notification with the custom action. We're using notification compat.builder to set the title and then some text. We then call add action which wires up the cancel button in the notification to the pending intent that we created earlier. When the user clicks on this action, the pending intent is routed to the foreground service that's executing the worker. The service then handles the intent and stops the worker. Android 12 introduces new foreground service restrictions. This means that an app cannot start a foreground service when it's in the background. 
starting Android 12, calling set foreground async can therefore result in a foreground service start not allowed exception. Work Manager can help you with this transition. It's actually so important to us that you get this right, that we recently released Work Manager 2.7 with support for expedited work. Expedited work is important to the user or it's user initiated. This work can be launched when the application is not in the foreground. A good example of work that needs to be expedited is a chat app where the app wants to download an attachment for a message or an app that wants to handle a payment or subscription flow. Expedited work is backed by a foreground service on API versions prior to Android 12. On Android 12, they're backed by an expedited job. Expedited work is subject to quotas. While the application is in the foreground, the expedited work is not subject to any quotas or restrictions. However, quotas will apply once the application is in the background. The execution quota is based on the app standby bucket and process importance. Expedited work is work that starts as soon as possible. This means it's latency sensitive. So we won't support things like initial delays or periodicity. It also is not a substitute for long running work being subject to quotas. When the, your user wants to send a message that's important, it should also happen as soon as possible with all other work manager guarantees. Let me show you how to implement that using an expedited jobs API. Here we have a send message worker that extends a coroutine worker. The worker is responsible for syncing messages from the backend for a chat app. Expedited work runs in the context of a foreground service, similar to long running work prior to Android 12. The worker therefore needs to implement get foreground info so we can show a notification. On Android 12, Work Manager won't show any additional notifications because the worker is backed by an expedited job. Implement the suspending do work like you would. Expedited jobs may be interrupted when you run out of quota. So the worker should ideally keep track of some state so it can resume once it's eventually rescheduled. To schedule expedited work, you can use the set expedited API. This tells Work Manager that this work request is important from the perspective of the user. Because the work is being scheduled is subject to quotas, you need to tell us what to do if the app were to run out of quota. There's two fallback behaviors here. The first is you can become a regular work request, that is, you're no longer expedited. The second option is to drop the request altogether if it can't be expedited. This means that no work is scheduled if the app were to run out of expedited quota. Work Manager starting 2.5 made several improvements for applications that support multiple processes. So let's explore those APIs and some motivation for them. To use the multiprocessing APIs, you need to define a dependency on the work multiprocess artifact. The goals of the multiprocessing APIs are, are avoid redundant or expensive parts of initialization for Work Manager in secondary processes. We want to reduce SQLite contention that happens when multiple processes acquire transaction locks on the same underlying SQLite database. We also want to ensure that the in-process scheduler runs in the correct process. To understand which parts are redundant, we need to understand what Work Manager does under the hood when it's initialized. Let's look at a single process in it first. The first thing that happens once the application is launched is that the platform calls application on create. At some point in the process lifecycle, workmanager.getInstance is called, and it kicks off Work Manager's initialization routine. When Work Manager is initialized, we run four stop runable. This is important because this is where Work Manager checks if the app was previously four stopped. It ensures that jobs that should have been scheduled are actually scheduled by comparing what Work Manager knows with what job scheduler or alarm manager know. It also reschedules previously interrupted work, for example, after a process crash. As you can tell, this is expensive. We're comparing and reconciling state across multiple subsystems, and ideally, we only want to do this once per app. The other important thing to note is that the in-process scheduler only runs in the default process. Let's look at what happens when the app has a second process. When you have a second process, we essentially repeat what happened with the first process. So the first process initializes as before. Given that this is the designated primary process, the in-process scheduler runs in this process. For the second process, we essentially repeat what we did in the first process. Application on create is invoked again, which in turn reinitializes work matter at some point. This would mean that we would repeat all the work we did in the first process. You might be wondering why we run four stop runnable in the second process at all. 
This is because Work Manager doesn't actually know which of these processes is important. If the app is a keyboard or a widget, then the primary process may not be the same as the default process. Secondary processes also don't get to run the in-process scheduler, given this is not the default process. Where the in-process scheduler runs is actually very important, because it can significantly improve throughput, given it's not subject to scheduling limits other persistent schedulers have. For example, job scheduler has a limit of 100 jobs. The in-process scheduler does not suffer from these limits. Let's look at how we define the designated default process. For this, we use Work Manager's Configuration Builder. We set the default process name to the one we want to use. This is usually the app's package name. Once the application defines a default process, the in-process scheduler runs in that process. What about secondary processes, though? Is there a way we can completely avoid initializing Work Manager in the secondary process? Turns out there is. What we really want here is to not have to initialize Work Manager at all. To make that possible, we introduced Remote Work Manager. The class binds to the designated process and forwards all requests made in the second process to the designated process using a bound service. This also means that you avoid all cross-process SQLite contention altogether, because there's only one process, the designated process, writing to the underlying SQLite database. In the second process, you can create work requests like you did before. And instead of using Work Manager, here we use Remote Work Manager instead. This binds to the designated process using a bound service and forwards the request to NQ by parceling your request over to the designated process. The way this works is we manifest merge the remote work manager service to the application's Android manifest.xml. This is the service that gets used to forward the requests. We looked at how work manager allows you to define the designated process. That is sometimes still not enough because you might want to run a worker in a different process. An example of when you might want to do something like this is an ML pipeline running in the secondary process for an app that also has a dedicated UI process. You may want to isolate this work to a secondary process so that the crash in this process does not take the rest of the app down, especially the parts responsible for the UI. To run the worker in a different process, you should extend remote coroutine worker, analogous to the coroutine worker. Once you extend remote coroutine worker, you have to implement do remote work. This method is executed in the secondary process. We still need to define which process the worker needs to bind to. We do that by adding an entry to the application's Android manifest.xml. The app can define one or more remote worker services, each in a unique process. Here you can see we're adding a new service in a secondary process called background. Now that you define the service in the Android manifest.xml, you still need to specify the component name we want to bind in the work request. A component name is a combination of a package name plus the class name, which we are adding to the work request input data. We then create the work request with the input data so Work Manager knows which service to bind to. We enqueue the work like we always do. When Work Manager executes this work, it first binds the service based on what was defined in the input data and executes do remote work. All the heavy lifting for cross-process communication is handled by Work Manager here. And now, let's talk about tooling improvements and the App Inspector in Android Studio. Earlier in this presentation, I mentioned improved tooling support. Now it's time to see that in action. Starting with Android Studio Arctic Fox, you can inspect and debug workers directly from within Android Studio using the Background Task Inspector. The Background Task Inspector is part of the App Inspection Suite, which gives you detailed insights into several aspects of your apps. To get the most information out of the inspector, your app must use Work Manager 2.5 or newer. The fastest way to open app inspection for the first time is to hit the shift key twice. This opens a dialog that enables searching everything from code over actions to menus. Here you type app inspection and hit enter. This will bring up the app inspection panel. Alternatively, you can find app inspection in the menu under view, tool windows, app inspection. Now that you know how to enable it, let me switch to a demo and show you how to use it. I'm using Android Studio Bumblebee and the Work Manager sample from GitHub for this demo. After opening app inspection, I land in the background task inspector tab. Now to see information about my workers, I kick off the image filtering process in the sample app by selecting on filters and clicking apply. 
let's slow this down for a moment. While the filter process is ongoing, I can see the status of each worker moving through its lifecycle. Since these are workers that run in sequence, the cleanup worker needs to finish before the next one can begin. So all other workers are currently either enqueued or blocked. Now that the cleanup worker is done, the other workers along the continuation can do their work. I can also see the whole continuation in one picture. To do so, I select a single worker and then switch to the graph view by clicking on this icon. The graph view is essential for more complex continuations. From both views I can also click directly on any worker and get detailed insights. At the top we have a basic description, including a clickable class name and a unique ID. I mentioned that Work Manager persists your work data. Let me show you how, using the Database Inspector, by clicking on the Database Inspector tab. Here I can look for the unique ID in the WorkSpec table, where I see that all the information around this particular execution has been persisted. Let's continue in the Background Task Inspector. I can also see exactly in which line this particular execution was enqueued. That's super convenient, especially when comparing it with searching for calls manually. I can also see if there has been any constraints on a particular worker, as well as more detailed information on frequency and execution status. Work Manager can use the output data of one of the workers and pass it into another worker down the pipeline. You can see this in the results. The output data includes a unique identifier for each worker and it's passed along the work continuation. Everything completed as expected this time, but I'd like to show you what happens if a worker along the change have fails. To do this, I inserted a failure worker into the work continuation and restarted the application. As you can see, the results from the previous run are still here for me to inspect. Again, that's what we mean by keeping work persistent. I already selected another image. Now I enable filters and apply them. After selecting any worker, I click on the graph view again and can quickly see where work started to fail, thanks to the exclamation point rather than a check mark. From there, I can directly click into the worker and continue my debugging session. This failure is expected, so I stop the demo here. This concludes our session on Work Manager. You now know that Work Manager is the recommended solution for persistent work. You can request and cancel long running tasks with Work Manager, have learned when and how to use the expedited work APIs, and know how Work Manager enables you to write solid and performance multi process apps. On top of that, you've learned how to use the Background Task Inspector. And we have even more resources available for you to learn more about Work Manager. Early this year, we released an in-depth video series on Work Manager that takes you from the basic topics over threading to advanced configuration and testing. We even got to answer many of your questions in our live Q&A session. We also published multiple code labs to give you guided hands-on experience with Work Manager. And of course, you can find documentation as well as code samples. All the links are also in the description. Let us know what you think in the comments. And if you'd like to see more content like this, Give us a thumbs up. Thanks for watching.
Hi everyone, and welcome to the first Ask Android live session on modern Android development. My name is Rebecca Franks, and I'll be your host for this session. We will be answering your questions on architecture components, Kotlin, Android Studio, and performance. There is also a separate Jetpack Compose and Material U Ask Android session tomorrow. We will be able to ask deeper questions related to those specific topics. So feel free to pop your questions into the chat, and we'll try to answer as many as possible. But before we get into that, a quick round of intros from everyone that we have in the panel today. Hi, uh, I'm Yit. I work in the Android Jetpack team. Hi, everyone. I'm Manuel Vigo, and I'm part of the Android Developer Relations team. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda. I'm a product manager on Android. Hello, I'm Wojtek. I'm an engineer on the Developer Relations team. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. All right, so just a quick reminder, pop the questions into the live chat, and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So we do have a couple that already came in from Twitter before the show, so we we'll can dive straight into asking some of them. And the first one, um, if somebody is very interested in Android development and has no idea about Jetpack uh, Compose or Jetpack in general, what is your advice for them? Great, I can, I can take that question. That's a great question. I think there are a lot of people in that situation, and this is something that the team has thought about um, and has uh, provided and created resources for getting started. So the purpose of Jetpack is to help developers build Android apps with modern design practices. So it's a suite of libraries uh, to help you accelerate your development, uh, follow best practices, re reduce boilerplate, and then also write code that works consistently across different Android versions and also Android devices. Um, so the components work, uh, they can be adopted individually or they can work together. Um, if you go to um, android.developer.com slash jetpack, uh, there's a lot of information there. Uh, there's also a getting started um, walkthrough, a page that walks you through the various different um, articles, uh, code labs, online training that really walks you through um, overall how to approach uh, either um, adopting Jetpack into your existing app or creating a new app uh, with Jetpack. Um, there's lots of examples. Um, and so there's a lot of great resources there. Um, and if there's any feedback uh, that anyone has on additional things that can help uh, people ramp up and, and that really dive into the material, uh, we're definitely uh, uh, happy to, to get that feedback. And also, if anyone's a complete beginner, we also have training courses that are made specifically to walk you through like getting started with programming, and they also teach the best practices with Jetpack. So if you search for Android Basics in Kotlin, for example, uh, you can get started. And from there, you can go and explore the different Jetpack libraries as well. Awesome. OK, next question. What is the best way to collect flows in from the Android UI? I think uh, I can take this question. The, the best way and the safest one is to use the, the repeat on lifecycle suspend function. And actually, you would collect from the flow inside the body uh, of the function. Alternatively, you can use the flow with lifecycle flow operator. And that's going to be practically the same thing. The good thing about these APIs is that they are lifecycle aware. And so they are only going to collect from the flow whenever the UI is visible on the screen which is something that the alternatives then do. So yeah, use those APIs. Awesome. OK, I have some performance problems in my app. Where do I go to start debugging with these kind of issues? And what tools should I use? Uh, so we have a few different Jetpack libraries uh, that target uh, optimizing performance. So. Uh, there's a macro benchmark library that helps you measure startup um, and scrolling or jank uh, frame performance within your app. Um, and then we also have a benchmark library that measures uh, CPU cost of specific functions. Um, so these libraries, um, they can be used remotely um, to track uh, metrics in a continuous integration uh, form, or um, you can also do them locally. And profiling results are viewable within uh, Android Studio. So. In terms of uh, tooling, there's also um, within Studio, there are um, various different profiler tools that you can use to measure um, different metrics that you're looking at for performance. Um, and then we know that performance is, is a very difficult thing to, uh, even if you get the metrics and you, you know, you're seeing the data to figure out how can you troubleshoot, how can you really optimize it? There's um, some guidance that we have provided as well um, online to help you walk through some specific examples um, just to kind of um, give additional guidance and uh, additional uh, hints as to where you can start diving deeper into the data that's output from your um, benchmark data. 
Yeah, additionally, there was a perform performance math skill series that happened something like a month ago. So I highly recommend everyone to check out the YouTube uh, channel where we have like four or five videos about performance there. Also a Q&A session with the team. That was very helpful. Great. So when is the next Android Studio coming out? So I, I guess I can take this one. Uh, so we don't normally give dates uh, because any any date that we give, you know, release a slip and then it wouldn't be fair to give everyone this expectation that the release is on a certain date. But, you know, if you follow Android Studio's tracks like Canary and Beta and then release candidates, you can more or less figure out uh, when the next stable release will be. Um, and it's basically when we are confident um, through release candidates that you know any major bugs are found and fixed, uh, we don't want to we don't want people to encounter any major problems uh, at launch. So the one thing I can uh, ask everyone to do is test out the beta versions, uh, the pre-release versions, and do let us know if you find anything um, that's not working. Uh, Great. So for new apps or features, should I learn motion layout over Compose? Difficult question. OK, I'll give it a try. <laughs> I, so we, learning motion layout over Compose is not like not super accurate because they are they different view systems. Uh, Ideally, you should go with Compose, especially for a new app. There's not much reason to try to write an application with the old view system unless you have some like historical code base. Uh, we have constraint layout working in uh, Compose already. I don't know the plans for motion layout. I assume it will probably come, but like the Compose animation APIs are so beautiful that you can actually do a lot of those stuff yourself with Compose a lot easier than you were able to do with the views. And in the worst worst case scenario, if you really want to use motion layout, you could embed regular views inside your Compose applications. They're fully interoperable. Uh, so you can always do that by my recommendation is go towards Compose because that's the feature. Great. That was a little bit of a burning question, I think. <laughs> All right, so now there's apparently one that's super popular. Um, everyone wants to know the answer to this one. What is preferred, MVVM or MVI? Manuel? Okay, yeah, I think I can take this one. In fact, I, there isn't that much difference between the, the two approaches. Like for people that don't know, MVVM refers to model B view model, MVI and model view intent. And both of them are you know, a way to do unidirectional data flow, which is actually the preferred way to architect your, your applications. So, I mean, the one you choose depends on the needs of your application, depends on if you want to model user intents with MVI, and then having pretty much everything reactive or not. It depends on, on your app, but uh, I mean, no matter which one you use, you are set up for success. I think those are good patterns because they, they follow UDF, as I was mentioning before. Great. Okay. Best way to communicate from update of data from the repo to a view model? Flows. Uh, flows or suspend functions. It depends whether it's a, a one shot call, then it's a suspend function. If you need to stream of data, use flows. That's a recommendation. Yeah. So, like something to add there. Like, no, normally when you try to design these problems, thinking about how can a repository notify a view model, it will kind of get you into trouble because the view model has a smaller life cycle than a repository regularly. The way to think about this is mostly if view model is interested in some information from the repository, it will observe something or like collect something, whether you're using RxJava or, or coroutines. Uh, but that, that, that small difference of like a, the thinking perspective, whether you're trying to not, like change something in your view model and something happens in repository versus thinking about your view model, observing some data in your repository because it is interested in the information will actually help you avoid a lot of problems down the line. So always think about whatever has a smaller life cycle that observes the one that has a 
larger life cycle. And that, that kind of thinking goes very well with UDF as well. Uh, so try to look at the problems from that perspective, and that will be a lot more straightforward for every single case you will face, whether it is between the repository and the view model or the view model and the views. What about lab data? Live data is fine. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the thing about live data is like it's a very purposeful class that we build for your UI to hold the state for your UI. When you try to use a live data from your repository, it just doesn't scale. And like we don't want to scale it because there's already better reactive libraries. The whole purpose of live data was like just to be very simple to solve a specific case. Uh, so just only use it for that if you need to. Especially if you're using like Kotlin coroutines and flow, you almost have no reason to use live data, but you can if it is easier. Uh, but yeah, like trying to use live data in your repositories or in your rest of your application, is just not going to scale well. Yeah, so seeing the live data outside of the UI layer, it's a smell. So reconsider your architecture and all that. And um, historically, like people use live data because it was integrated with data binding and all that. But for example, right now, state flow is supported by data binding. And now we have these new lifecycle aware routines APIs. So yeah, like live data, it's pretty good for what it does, but let's we'll try to move it uh, away from its responsibilities because it's not gonna work. Okay, cool. Um, all right, next, next question. How to start with multi-module apps using Hilt? I think the best way to start, it's uh, taking a look at the docs. Uh, the documentation is going to give you pretty much everything that you need. And regarding multi-modules, it pretty much works as if you had like everything in the app module, because you know, like different modules could expose bindings to different components in the same way. If you are talking specifically about dynamic feature modules, we have a separate page in the documentation that talks about it. So I would highly recommend to, to check those out. Great. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Work Manager then. Uh, so the question that's come in is, does Work Manager replace background service? Uh, I don't know what, what's a background service? I, I think if this is the, like the old services in Android, yeah, like there's absolutely no reason to do that. But like Work Manager is designed for uh, stuff that should run like it's important to run it and you can also defer it. Those are the, the two two key points of work manager. So if it doesn't have to run, like it's not any different than your background executor or anything you dispatch uh, through your core it is. Uh, the key difference there is like it's something you want to run, like sending an email, sending a TV that uh, this when you use work manager. Now you can, in the very, very old days of Android, there was a good reason to create these services. So the operating system knew you were doing something. They're probably still relevant. Honestly, I don't know if the operating system still considers them in deciding whether it wants to keep your application uh, running or not. Uh, but there's not really much reason to use them anymore. Uh, so either use your regular executors if you don't care about losing the work, or if it is important to use Work Manager. Yeah, work manager is supposed to be doing persistent work, work that you need to persist. And probably the question was more related to the recent changes, or not changes, additions to work manager, which was about being able to run foregrounds, foreground services as well. So definitely you can use work manager for that. And now there are new restrictions happening with Android 12. And there are new APIs in work manager, the new version 2.7 that actually it's with this set expedited API that is gonna help you out with these new changes in, in Android 12. So check out the docs. Oh, okay, so if, the, so if the question is more about the foreground services, yes, and like overall, uh, we, we wanted to have foreground services early on because like if developer really, really wanted to run in the background, they need to have a reason that they need to show to the user. Uh, later we realized it kind of gets abused by the applications and then it creates a lot of noise in the notification shade. Uh, so now there's a new expedited job API and the work manager handles the backwards compatibility for you, whether you're running on an older version or not. Uh, 
Uh, so just take a look at the release notes for work major 2.7 and that will include what you need to adapt in your application to support the uh, Android 12. Great, lots to learn there. So are there any scenarios that need to be handled with live data rather than using flows? Oh, if not necessarily, like if the, the, the biggest difference between live data and outlook flows is that live data has pre-imposed limitations on how it works that makes this API simple it is very opinionated on how to handle your life cycle and whatnot. So they're all advantages of live data, but they're also the reason why it does not scale to things like background because it's very, very opinionated. Uh, so I think Jose from Android Derwell has a very, very good blog post on uh, trying to convert the live data into a state flow and I explain the differences. So I will say, go read that article and if your use case, if you still believe live data is better for your use case, you can totally use it. Like it's not banned or uh, no, it's not deprecated. But oftentimes like, you can get the same thing with state flow and then it's one less technology to use in your application, which makes it easier to maintain going forward. And also with the new APIs that Manuel mentioned today with the lifecycle aware coroutines APIs that we have, I think they pretty much replicate what live data can do, right? So maybe before these API existed, live data was actually the simpler choice. Uh, now, as as he said, you can get rid of live data if you want to and just, just rely on flows and the APIs that we give you. And correct me if I'm wrong, Manuel, I think you have a talk about this where you explain some of that, right? Yeah, so the talk is uh, Kotlin flows in practice. So if you want to learn about flows in Android, go check it out. Great. Okay. So hopefully those are the last live data questions. Um, how can we reduce build times in Android Studio? Right. So that is a big topic. And we know it's on both developers' minds as well as here the engineers at Google are working on this. Uh, the, the problem is that the build is not just one thing. It's everything from you know Gradle and our plugins from for Gradle as well as the compilers, uh, the other components that build and package resources and so on. And we are tackling the problem uh, one by one. I think the best thing you can do as developers is try to stay on the newest version. So um, whenever we have new versions of Android Gradle plugin, of uh, Kotlin, of you know the various things that you use in your build, also any external plugins that you have, try to update them uh, because oftentimes with new releases, we either fix bugs, like bugs that uh, maybe invalidate your caches when they shouldn't. Uh, we make the build more incremental. We uh, work on the speed, speed itself. And uh, there's also new tools coming out like uh, KSP, which I hope he might uh, talk about in a second, that will make your builds fa build faster in certain scenarios. Um, so yeah, that's my best advice. And also, try not to do too much custom stuff in your build if you don't have to, like making plugins that work well for um, for Gradle and for Android Gradle plugin is not easy. Uh, so if you can, try to stick to just the declarative DSL style configuration. And uh, if you need to do anything more, um, you really need to learn how to do it properly. Interesting. I think there's a lot to learn and a lot to improve. There's so much to cover for making your build smoother and there's so many different things you can do. Okay, so is there a smooth way to transition from legacy pre-Jetpack apps into modern awesome Jetpack apps? I was <laughs> hoping maybe Manuel will take it. <laughs> I mean, there isn't a checklist that you can say, okay, my app, it's uh, fully Jetpack now. I think it's more of a case of, for me, in my opinion, obviously, it's it's all about your architecture. If your architecture is able to scale, and um, for example, you depend on interfaces where you can replace, for example, you know, the, the dependency or your, in your database and things like that, that's really going to set up your app for success, and it's going to make it able to scale. So the idea is get, try to choose a, a good architecture, have it in place, 
make the, the dependencies that you depend on replaceable in the sense that now if I need to replace, I don't know, uh, search preferences with data store, that's an easy move. So that, that would be my best tip. It do you want something to add? Yeah, I think, I, I guess we, we haven't been hearing this question much because it's been like a couple of years since we had jet, started Jetpack. Uh, but like one of the key things, like maybe if you just even talk, thinking about the specific Jetpack libraries, when you are, write the component in your application, try not to reinvent the wheel. So if there is a, like a well accepted open source library or a, there's a Jetpack library, prefer to learn and use that instead of like creating your own, because even though you might feel more comfortable with the implementation, you know, but we spend a lot of time and effort making sure this library works in all the versions, like handles interesting cases, like the, the foreground changes is a very nice uh, example of that happened where like the, it completely changed in the platform. But if you are using work manager, there's just like minor adjustments you need to wait, make to support it. Versus if you are not using work manager, you will need to change a lot of code to support that. And then like that happens every single version. So I would say try to use either the Jetpack libraries or the like well-known open source libraries that are already supported by the developers uh, to reduce your liability in your code base. And please test your code. That's really important because if you want to make any change, you don't want to break anything. And testing is the, the, the insurance that you have to, to do that. Yeah, it's like, actually, this is a very good example use case. Like in, in Jetpack, uh, you know, it's all of this is in open source where we develop, but we also have a downstream branch that uses the tip of three Android. So whatever is in the Android source code master and runs all of our tests with that as well. This makes sure if something is going to break in the next version of Android, we actually get notified about it months, months before, and we have to fix it then. Uh, so that will give you a lot of confidence that once the new version of Android comes, you need to update your Jetpack libraries, but then you can be much more comfortable to set your like target SDK version immediately to the new one after doing that update. Awesome. Okay, so next question. Does view models and hilt or dagger have a place in the compose world? Yeah, they do. Um, we actually recommend that as a for example, a B model. Actually, uh, this is gonna be a shameless plug, but uh, there is a, a talk in ABS about, uh, it's called a composed state of mind, where they actually talk about the different ways to handle state complexity in Compose. And in there, you're gonna find things like a composable, something that we call now state holders, and the view model. The view model is supposed to be that stakeholder that is gonna be in charge of providing access to the business logic of the app and providing the UI state for a particular screen. And so you can see you are gonna find view models kind of in the root level of your screen. We could be a route if you are using uh, the Compose navigation. So yeah, they, they have a place in Compose and um, please check out the talk. Okay, cool. So moving on to um, something that was mentioned a bit earlier. Is there any bets on building multi-platform apps? And the next question is also kind of related. Can we use Room, Hilt, et cetera, in KMM? Uh, not yet. <laughs> so the, the Kotlin multi-platform is something we are looking into. You might see this in ASP, uh, that like, we understand developers are interested in the technology and developers also use Jetpack. And we don't want Jetpack to be a blocker from you moving to KMM. So you don't need to decide between, do I do KMP versus Jetpack? Uh, now, I want to highlight that when we do this, like first we need to validate it, of course. But aside from that, if we, let's say, make a library like Groove multi-platform, we need to make sure it has no impact on the Android on the user. So it needs to be a smooth transition, everything from documentation to, you know, like. Uh, API compatibility, they still work as expected for existing users. So it is not that straightforward for us to move a library to Kotlin multi-platform, uh, but we are looking into technology, like trying to validate it, uh, play with some of the smaller Jetpack libraries to see how it works. So you might be able to see more on this in the future, uh, but right now, no, you cannot, but we are looking into it. 
Um, so if you're interested, just like look at the ASPCLs through GitHub, uh, see what we are doing. Maybe you can even be able to contribute. Uh, it's a long road ahead, but we think this technology might actually work very well. Uh, so we are excited about Kotlin multi-platform as well. Uh, okay, great. So what is the best practice to handle network exceptions or other exceptions using coroutines? The best way is just to use the mechanism that coroutines provide you to handle exceptions. I guess probably that's the answer. We have a bunch of articles about error handling. We also have some talks we've done in the past, uh, but you don't you need to do anything. Just rely on the mechanism that it's built in in, in coroutines. So it's going to propagate exceptions automatically. For example, you need to understand a little bit how supervisor jobs or supervisor scopes versus coroutine scopes works and all that. There is a, a big amount of things that you have to learn, but then everything makes sense after all. Okay, cool. So how do I automate the process of publishing an app onto the Google Play Store? Uh, I can take this one. So we don't, I believe we don't have anything uh, that's ready made like in Android Studio or in Android Gradle plugin uh, for this. Uh, we know that it's something that the community might want, uh, but actually there is a, a really nice third party plugin that you can use with together with Android Gradle plugin to automate this. Um, so, you know, we might explore providing something like this out of the box in the future, but um, until that happens, if we make that decision or not, um, you can use the open source library for that. Okay, cool. Is there a way to unit test the pager class using remote mediator? If so, where can I find examples? This one's quite specific. Uh, I think so. Right now, I don't think you can, besides having a real collector that will require a UI. Uh, we do have plans to create a like test helper for paging to address these cases because it relies on some internal APIs that we don't want to expose yet. Uh, so right now, the ideal thing is just unit test your remote mediator or integration test your actual paging. Like one of the things about paging is is very very UI dependent, like it tries to optimize for what you are showing in the UI. Uh, so without having that piece of the code, it becomes a little bit harder to control it. Uh, we know we should add the testing library, so we are going to work on that. But aside from that, I would say either unit test your remote mediator or do an integration test with the UI. Great. Okay. And then what does the macro benching, macro benchmarking library do? So for macro benchmark, um, this library helps you um, uh, set tests for both uh, startup times for your app. If you want to test um, different stages of startup, cold start, warm start, um, and then also helps you test jank uh, or the different frame performances of your app. Um, so if you're uh, you have an app where there's a lot of lots of scrolling um, that's being done. You want to make sure that there are no drop frames. Um, so it lets you help up specific tests for scenarios that are um, more in line with how users are actually using your app. Um, so there are bigger use cases or scenarios that you can set and target within your app um, and in terms of uh, measuring those two things. So those are the main things that we're doing right now. And then we're also looking at what are the other key performance metrics um, do we want to track and, and help uh, help you track uh, within your app and add that to the macro benchmark library. But right now we're focusing on uh, startup and jank because those are two different performance metrics that really impact uh, the usability of your app um, and, and uh, impacts business metrics, things like that. And so that's what the feedback that we've gotten that developers really care about. And so that's where we started, but we're planning to continue to expand macro benchmark as well. Great, that sounds super useful. Does data store support encryption? Uh, not out of the box. So we, we are actually thinking about creating that integration as well. But right now, with, when you use data store, you can provide how you serialize it to disk. So you can have your own encryption behind data store. 
It's just there's no module that does it out of the box for you. Uh, but it's, it's super simple if you have an encryption library to uh, inject it to data store. We are also looking forward to providing something very similar to how we do with encrypted shared preferences. Uh, but it will take a while because we want to take it out of shared preferences, make the library by itself, and then use the APIs provided by data store uh, to support encryption out of the box. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thanks. Unfortunately, we run out of time. So thanks so much for all your questions. If you have any more, do feel free to reach out to the panelists on Twitter if you have any further questions. And be sure to join the packets on the live stream. Thanks for watching and goodbye. Hi, I'm Chris, a software engineer on the Material Design team. We'd like to share a vision for how to bring beautiful design to Android apps seamlessly and with less toil. Building on the promise of modern Android development, we have an opportunity to reimagine how designers and developers build digital products together. Today, delivering a great mobile UI is a slow, detail-oriented process. It requires a ton of back and forth between designers and developers. And like most of you, our teams get frustrated with the time it takes to answer simple questions. What typeface is this? What's the margin? How does this thing stretch? We're just copying values from emails, chat, and bug tickets. It doesn't feel productive. And we still sometimes have last minute scrambles because our assumptions were wrong. We call this the handoff problem, and developers tell us it's one of the biggest frustrations in building digital products. Some teams have been able to get around this through brute force and late nights, but as customer expectations and the number of screens increase, it's getting a lot harder, even for Material and Google. Android gives us the chance to reach billions of users. We're meeting them on phones, TVs, cars, watches, and tablets. That's a huge surface area for your products and services. And the challenge of delivering on all those screens makes our handoff problems untenable. Today, we're excited to share a glimpse of how Material and Android are working to solve the handoff problem for designers and Android developers in the tools they use today. To achieve this, Material Design is teaming up with Figma, the leading UI design tool. Figma is super excited about enabling new design to code workflows, and we're working together to ensure that design tools and developer tools connect. We've prototyped a new workflow that aims to make handoff a thing of the past. Our goal is to help teams build UI components together, starting in Figma and packaging for Android Studio. Let's take a look. In our workflow, designers build UI components in Figma that are ready for production. This plugin-based workflow adds to Figma's already robust component model with annotations for interactions and data. This workflow creates what we call a UI package. Developers can bring UI packages into Android Studio as composables at high fidelity, allowing us to immediately integrate components into the code base. Figma frames are converted to compose layouts. Visual appearance properties like color, typography, and shape are preserved. And responsive design intent, like flexible rows and columns, comes right across. Developers can use Compose Previews to see exactly what the designer saw, giving us confidence that the structure is right. Have you ever struggled with that first implementation because the imagery and typefaces were marooned in a design file someplace? We solve that problem by bringing all sample images and Google fonts along to ensure you have the right assets in place. This workflow translates ideas, not just pictures. So when a UI package arrives, it feels alive and can be controlled the way developers expect. Designers and developers decide how data is wired up to UI elements. Text, images, and icons are marked as dynamic, and Android Studio helps developers see just which data needs to be provided. Interactions work the same way. Designers indicate which gestures to support on a per-element basis, clearly marking calls to action in UI components that generate developer-friendly APIs. And styles in the design become theme references in code, giving us visual consistency with the rest of our application. We want to give you the flexibility to build any UI you can imagine without reinventing the wheel. 
So when designers use material components like fabs and buttons in Figma, we make sure you get real material design implementations in code. This is a new way of exchanging UI as an updatable package. When designers make changes, developers can easily bring them in. UI packages are managed like code, so teams can use familiar workflows for tracking and review. Cosmetic changes don't even require new code, just update, validate, and go. Our output code is structured to be modular and extensible. Rather than requiring designer updates for everything, developers can override and remix elements to meet their needs. For example, we can add a specialized overlay or replace an entire section with a dynamic waveform rendering. Developers decide how much or how little customization to apply. If there's one certainty in software development, it's that requirements will change. UI packages provide the flexibility for teams to meet changing demands quickly with minimal rework. The future of Android is bright, with billions of users engaging with your products on an ever-growing surface area of devices. We believe that this new workflow can break designers and developers out of their silos to deliver on that opportunity faster and with less frustration. We can't wait for you to start turning handoff problems into high fives. Over the next few months, we'd like to work directly with a small group of teams as we prepare for a beta launch at I.O. next year. If you're interested in joining this early access program, we'd love to hear from you at material.io slash blog slash design to code. Thanks for watching. Hi, everyone. I'm Manuel Bebo, and let's talk about state in Compose. State is any value in an app that can change over time. Apps are stateful by nature. Whether they store data locally or in a server, state is what makes them valuable. In this talk, we'll look at JSNAC, snack ordering app that is one of the Compose samples. State is really important for this app. What items to show on the screen, showing snacks filtered by the user, or keeping track of the shopping cart. State plays a crucial role in most applications. The composition is the description of the UI built by Compose that describes the current state of the app. Here, you can see how the composition can be visually represented for the search screen. There, you can find a search bar, divider, and suggestions, all that part of the destination of the navigation graph of the app. In declarative frameworks like Compose, you describe the app's current state and the framework takes care of updating the UI for you whenever state changes. For example, when navigating to the cart screen, Compose re-executes that part of the UI that is affected by the state change. Now, instead of search, the navigation host is updated to display the cart screen. As every piece of UI is a composable function, when state changes, a recomposition takes place to display the new data on the screen. Let's focus on an individual cart item. It is an element that shows an item in your shopping cart and lets you change the quantity. We can build the UI using a row with two buttons and a text. But how do we keep track of the current quantity of the item in the cart? If we simply add a mutable variable to the composable function, we see that nothing happens. When tapping the increment and decrement buttons, the quantity doesn't change. The function is not recomposed with the state change, and that's because the quantity variable is not tracked by Compose. Compose has a special state tracking system in place that schedules recompositions for any composables that read a particular state. This allows Compose to be granular and just recompose those composable functions that need to change, not the whole UI. This is achieved by tracking not only writes, that is, state changes, but also reads to the state. Use Compose's state and mutable state types to make state observable. Compose will keep track of those composables that read state value properties and trigger a recomposition when its value changes. You can use the mutable state of function to create a mutable state. 
it takes in an initial value that can be mutated. Here, we use the value property to read and write the quantity state. But even if it's tracked by Compose and recompositions are triggered, you can see that the UI doesn't display the state changes. The issue is that even if the function recomposes, quantity is always initialized to 1. In fact, this is a common mistake. That's why attempting to write this code gives a compile error. To reuse the quantity state across recompositions, we need to make it part of the composition. To do that, you can store objects in the composition by using the remember composable function. It can be used to store both mutable and immutable objects. Remembering state is something you must do for state that is created in the composition, that is, inside composable functions. In this way, the state will be part of the composition and will be reused when the function recomposes. As you can see now, our cart item works as we expect. Since quantity is preserved across recompositions, the new mutated values appear on the screen. As a bonus, Compose also offers Remember Savable. It behaves similarly to Remember, but the stored value will survive the activity and process recreation. This is a good way for UI data to survive configuration changes. Remember Savable makes sense for UI state like the item quantities or the selected tab, but not for things like a transient animation state. Also, you can use property delegates with the state APIs. You can see that in action with the by keyword. It is a nice way to not have to access the value property every time. You should only mutate state outside the scope of a composable function because composables can run frequently and execute in any order. In our code, mutating quantity in the onClick listener is safe because onClick is not a composable function. You can trigger state changes given a user input, such as button clicks or using side effects. You can read more about side effects in our docs. The cart item composable is not reusable in its current form because it's always initializing its private quantity state to 1. Not every item in the cart will have that quantity to start with, but also a user might have items in the cart from previous sessions. Similar to what we do with dependency injection, to make the cart item reusable, we need to pass the quantity as a parameter to the function. But not only that, the quantity passed to cart item should be immutable to respect the single source of truth principle. This principle encourages structuring the code so that data is only modified in one place. In this case, if cart item doesn't own the state, it shouldn't be updating it. Therefore, cart item needs to notify the caller when the user interacts with the buttons to trigger state updates. Now that cart item is reusable, who owns the quantity for each cart item and the logic to update the state? We can imagine that something like a cart composable should have the information of all cart items and logic to update them accordingly. The process we followed to make cart item reusable is called state hoisting. We hoisted the quantity state from cart item to cart. State hoisting is a pattern of moving private state out of a composable to make it less stateful, therefore more reusable in your app. Stateless composable is a composable that doesn't hold any private state at all. Composables should receive state as parameters and communicate events up using lambdas. This makes the composable more reusable and testable, as it is not coupled to any specific way of handling data. State that is hoisted this way can be shared and intercepted if needed, and it complies with the single source of truth principle. Here, we have the stateless version of cart item receiving the quantity to display a state and exposing user interactions as events. Cart, that displays the different cart items in a lazy column, is responsible for calling cart item with the right information. The actual items on the cart is application data that we retrieve from cart view model. 
For each card item, we pass in its particular quantity. And the logic to increment or decrement quantities is delegated to the view model as the owner of card data. State hoisting is a pattern widely used in Compose. You can see it in most Compose APIs as a way to intercept and control the state used internally by those UI elements. As intercepting state is optional, default parameters are a powerful language construct. For example, if you need to control or share scaffold state, you can pass the state in. If not, it is created by default. How high do you hoist state? It is a matter of data ownership. When in doubt, hoist state to at least the lowest common ancestor of those composables that need access to that state. For example, the lowest common ancestor of card items is card, which is the one calling them with the right information. As another principle, composables should take only the parameters that they need. In JSNAC, we provide stateless card composable that takes only what it needs as a parameter. This makes this composable easier to preview and test. It complies with the single source of truth principle, and it is more reusable in case we need to show it alongside another screen, if the window size is big enough, for example. Apart from this, we also provide stateful override that is opinionated in the way that it handles state and events. This version of CART calls the stateless CART composable using a CART view model that handles the business logic and state. This pattern of having both stateful and stateless, or less stateful composable, provides a good balance between being able to reuse the composable if needed and having an opinionated way to use it in your app. In this case, using view models that are well integrated with Compose Navigation. To read more about state and state hoisting, check out the documentation. State should be hoisted to at least the lowest common ancestor, but should it always be in the composable itself? Let's examine the different ways to manage and define a source of truth for different types of state. Composables for simple UI element state management, state holders for complex UI element state management, and architectural components view models as a special type of state holders that provides access to business logic and prepares application data for presentation. Before we start, it is important to define what we mean when we talk about specific terms. UI element state is the hoisted state of UI elements, for example, scaffold state. The screen or UI state is what needs to be displayed on the screen. For example, card UI state that can contain the card items, messages to show to the user, or loading flags. This state is usually connected with other layers of the hierarchy because it contains application data. The UI behavior logic is related to how to display state changes on the screen. For example, navigation logic or showing snack bars. The UI behavior logic should always live in the composition. The business logic is what to do with state changes, for example, making a payment or storing user preferences. This logic is usually placed in the business or data layers, never in the UI layer. Now that we are all on the same page, let's see the different ways of handling state. If the UI element state to handle is simple, it could be placed in the composable itself. In this example, the Jesna app composable owns the scaffold state. A scaffold state contains mutable properties, all interactions with it should happen in this composable. Otherwise, if we pass it to other composables, they could mutate its state and that doesn't comply with the single source of truth principle and also makes tracking down bugs more difficult. But in reality, things can get more complicated. The snack app, apart from emitting UI elements, is in charge of showing snack bars, navigating to the proper screens, shutting up the bottom bar, and so on. Having all of that in the composable can make it difficult to read and understand. Following the separation of concerns principle, we can delegate the UI logic and UI element state to a different class that we call stateholder 
and leave the composable function to just emit UI elements. JSNACAP state will be the source of truth for JSNACAP's UI element state, so all state writes should happen inside the class. This state holder is a plain class that will be created and remembered in the composition. Therefore, it will be scoped to the composable that creates it. JSNACAP state is just a plain class, and since it follows the composable lifecycle, it can take compose dependencies without worrying about memory leaks. State holders can also have composable properties that will cause recompositions if they change. In this case, whether or not to show the bottom bar. And it contains UI related logic such as navigation logic. As covered in the talk previously, data must be remembered in order to reuse it across recompositions. It is a good practice to provide methods to remember state holders if they take dependencies. In here, we pass in the dependencies to remember as well to get a new instance of JSNAC app state if any of the dependencies change. Now, in JSNAC app, we get an instance of the app state that we use to pass the hoisted state into composables, check when we need to show UI elements, and call functions to trigger UI related actions. In a nutshell, state holder is a plain class that hoists UI element state and contains UI related logic. This favors separation of concerns by reducing composables complexity and favoring testability. It also makes state hoisting easier as there is only one state to hoist instead of multiple states. State holders can be really simple and focused. For example, this search state class for a search screen that only contains a list of active filters and search results. Use a state holder to help you manage complexity when you need to track state or UI logic. Apart from state holders, we also have view models that are classes that extend the architecture components view model class. View models can be used as state holders for state that is determined by business logic. View models have two responsibilities. First, providing access to the business logic of the application that is usually placed in other layers of the hierarchy, such as repositories or use cases. And second, preparing the application data for presentation in a particular screen. This is the UI state of the screen represented with an observable type. In a pure Compose app, we can use Compose's state types, but in a hybrid app, you might use another observable construct, like Stateflow. View models survive configuration changes, so they have a longer lifetime than the composition. They are not part of the composition, therefore, they cannot take state scope to the composition, for example, a remembered value. Be careful because this could cause memory leaks. As you can see, view models depend on other layers of the hierarchy, for example, repositories or use cases. Remember that if you want your UI to recompose when your state changes, you need to use Compose State APIs. But in this case, since the UI state is kept outside of the composition, it doesn't need to be remembered. You can just consume it, and the function will re-execute whenever it changes. Other layers of the hierarchy usually use streams of data to propagate changes, so it is possible you already get a hold of a flow in your view models. Streams of data also work perfectly with Compose, as there are helper functions to convert streams of data to Compose's observable state APIs. For example, collect a state collects values from the flow and represents them as state, causing a recomposition every time a new value is emitted into the flow. In summary, view models hoist state out of the composition and have a longer lifespan. They are responsible for the business logic of the screen and deciding what data to display, acquiring data from other layers and preparing it for presentation. Due to this, view models are recommended for screen level composables. View models have some benefits over plain state holders, though. Namely, operations triggered by them survive configuration changes. And they are well integrated with other Jetpack libraries, such as Hilt, and navigation. With Hilt, 
you can get view models using dependencies provided by Help with a line of code. And navigation caches view models while the screen is on the back stack, meaning that the data is instantly available when you return to a destination. Then, the view model is cleared when the destination is popped off the back stack, ensuring that your state is automatically cleaned up. All of this is more difficult to do with stakeholders that follow the life cycle of the composable screen. That said, if these benefits don't apply to your use case or you do things differently, you can move view model's responsibilities into stakeholders, whatever works best for you. It is also possible for a screen-level composable to have stakeholder and a view model. Since the view model lives longer, stakeholder could take the view model as a dependency. Putting this into practice, in addition to the cart view model we had in the cart composable, you could also have an additional cart state that contains UI element state and UI logic. For example, the lazy list state to know about the scroll position in large shopping carts, resources to format messages and prices, and the state of each item if we allow them to be expanded to show more information. Both view model and stakeholder have a place in cart. They serve different purposes and they can work together. If we look closer at their life cycle, cart state will follow the life cycle of the cart composable. It will be removed from the composition when cart is. And cart view model is scoped to a different life cycle, that of the navigation destination, graph, fragment, or activity. Looking at the big picture, the role of each entity is clearly defined. From the UI that contains UI elements to the data layer that contains business logic. Each serves a particular purpose. Here on the screen, you can see the different entities with their role and the potential dependency relationships between them. Hopefully, the table I showed before makes more sense now. So please keep it in mind for future decisions to have a clear state management story and architecture in your app. To learn more about state in Compose, check out our docs, code labs, and samples. Thank you everyone for listening. I hope this talk helps you get into a composed state of mind. Happy composing and talk to you soon. Bye.
and welcome to our Compose Basics Code Along. I'm Florina Montanescu, a Developer Relations Engineer in the Android team, and I'm joined here today by my colleague Yolanda Fe, who also works as a Developer Relations Engineer. Hi, everyone. In this session, we will be live coding various programming uh, challenges that you might have when you first start developing your app using Jetpack Compose. So as Yolanda is coding, feel free to open up Android Studio and follow along, or you can just sit back and watch and do the collab yourself at a later stage. We'll also be looking at the live chat on the YouTube stream. So if you have any questions, ask them in, those, in that chat. Our colleagues, Jose Acereca and Manuel Vivo will be answering them there. And then if we see that there are a lot of uh, questions being asked through the collab, we'll make sure that we also answer them here. So during the session, I will be sharing my screen uh, to make sure that you can code along. So let's get started. And we will open up a browser first and we will search for the Jetpack Compose Basics Code Lab. That's the code lab that we will be following today. So let's look that up and let's open up the code lab. There we go. During this session, we'll start by creating a new Compose project. We'll see what the Android Studio template generates, and then we'll start tweaking the UI. We'll learn how to reuse composables, how to add columns and rows, and then we'll dive into state in Compose and learn what state hoisting means. We'll finish by creating a performant lazy list, persisting our states, animating our list, and theming our app, depending on how much time we have. So let's start by going into Android Studio and open up a new project. So I will be using Android Studio Arctic Fox here, which is the latest stable release of Android Studio. And here I can start a new project. Um, if you have uh, earlier on also worked with Android Studio, you can also use File New Project instead. So let's go with New Project here and let's see what is being created for us. So we have to choose a template here. And what we will do is we will open the empty Compose activity template. And this will set up all the boilerplate that we need in order to build a Compose app. So we press next, and then we have to choose a name for our application. Let's go with Basics Code Lab, because that's the thing we're building right now. And you can choose another package name or another location if you want to. Uh, I will just leave these uh, as they are. And a minimum SDK. So make sure that you have at least API 21, which is the lowest supported version for Compose. But if you want to go higher, that's, of course, also a possibility. So I will press finish here. And while this is being set up, I will go back to the code lab and I will ask Farina a question. Can you tell us a little bit more about what Compose actually is? Yes. So Jetpack Compose is a modern toolkit designed by Google to simplify UI development. It uses a reactive program model and you write your UI using Kotlin. Compose is a fully declarative UI framework, which means that you describe your UI by calling a series of functions that transform data into UI hierarchy. When the underlying data changes, the framework automatically recalls this function, uh, these functions updating the view hierarchy for you. Okay, has the, has the project built? Can we see uh, how this looks in our project? It's almost there but we can already see the main activity. So I think we can Great. continue. Oh, look at that, and the composable. So Compose is these so-called composable functions. So these are actually just regular functions, but they're in line with the app composable annotation. And then each of these in turn can call other composable functions, like here, the, the text. And a function is actually all you need to create a new UI component because saying composable functions every time is quite long. We're just gonna call these composables for short. So let's take another look at this main activity. So as in the old view world, the activity is still the entry point for our ap application. So the activity has an onCreate method which sets the things up for your application. And inside that onCreate method, you can see this set content uh, call. And that's actually our way to move to transition into the compose world. So within that set content block, we can start calling composable functions. So inside here, all the way to the bottom, you see that greeting is being called, which is the composable uh, function that was mentioned before by Florina. And surrounding that greeting uh, method is surface. And the surface is a kind of a container composable. So this is also a composable. And I'll quickly dive into the actual implementation with command B or control B um, to see what that looks like. So as you can see, this is also a composable uh, function. 
and it has a lot of values that we can set in order to adapt the, the values of that service. Uh, in our case, a lot of these have like default values, so we don't have to adapt them. They have reasonable defaults, but we can change things if we want to. So let's go back into our main activity and see what else is here. We have a basics code lab theme, and this is um, a way for us to style our app, to give it a certain material styling. And we will talk about that a little bit later. And then if we go all the way to the bottom, um, so what we can do is we can actually run this application on our emulator or on a device, and we will do that later. But we can also use a uh, preview, which is directly inside Android Studio. And I will open it, and this will have to build for a bit. But you can actually see that you can create another method and just call it preview or whatever name you want. Just make sure it doesn't get any parameters. And inside, you can also call these composable methods. And that will actually generate for you a specific um, preview that you want. So while this is building, let's take a look at what else we will be doing. Yeah, so right now we just have a simple project, but you'll see once the, once the project builds, you'll see that it just displays a greeting. And I think that's a bit boring. So I think we should start updating the UI and changing the color of the greeting. Yeah, let's see. There it is. Yes. Is building. There we go. Yeah. So, so yeah, we, I think we just have a text right on the screen right now. So how would we tweak that, Florina? What do we want to do with it? Uh, let's change the color of the greeting and add some spacing around it. Yeah, exactly. That's what the, what the collab suggests us to do. Okay, so the first thing we want to do, let's say that we start by changing the background color. So as you can see, this is now just plain white. And let's try to make that a purple color instead. So what we can do in order to get that done is we can use that same surface that we were using before. So we can actually surround our text and we can surround it with a container. In our case, the container is the surface container, which is a material component that we can use and that just Basically, you can set colors for that container, and then it will just put whatever you put in there, it will put on top of that color. So in our case, we can set the color of that container to be, and I'm using material theme here, which is, uh, again, a little bit about the styling of your app. Um, so we will use the color primary here. And if we use that primary color and we can use the different colors from the material design, uh, that should actually update the background of our surface. And one thing that you might notice as well, if you look at this, is that it's not just changing the background color, but actually our text color changed as well. It's now white. And that's because material design is an opinionated framework. And that means that it tries to do the best thing. So it tries to make sure that even if you don't do not make a lot of changes to your code, it actually does them for you and it tries to behave in a logical manner. So in this case, what our surface actually does, if we go into it again, we can see that when we set the color, it actually chooses a content color for you. So it uses a, it calls a function to see what the content color should be. And in the first case, we had a white background, it was using, using black, but in the case that we use our primary color from our theme, which is purple, it actually chooses the white color on top. So this way we can actually create a nice UI. And now we want to add some spacing around this. And this actually introduces the second big concept of building uh, UI with Compose, and that's modifiers. So next to creating composables and nesting composables, you can also add modifiers to basically all your composables. And the modifiers you can set, and they basically modify your composable, which is why they're called modifiers. And there's a lot of them. Like you can see there's padding, there is a focusable modifier, a clickable, a background, a size. There's a whole range of different modifiers which all in some way modify the composable that they're being uh, set on. So in our case, we want to add some spacing around our text. So we will use padding. And the padding that we will set is 24 dB. So in the meantime, if you get stuck during uh, building this, if I'm going too fast, in the code lab, there's actually a lot of uh, places where there is a bit of code of where you should be at that moment. So when you get stuck, try to go back to uh, the beginning of your, um, or to the step in the code lab, and you can just copy and paste this. Let's see. 
So while we're building this, it has having some issues with importing. There we go. Let's see if it already imported. So it uses all these imports from the Compose libraries in order to get things done. And in our case, I think it's having some issues importing the 24 DB. So while it's building, let's go back to the code lab and see what the next thing is that we want to do. Yeah, maybe we can uh, copy paste the import from uh, from the code lab, uh, just in case it can't yeah. find it. Yeah, exactly there. There we go. Uh, hey, one thing, uh, Yolanda mentioned that there are a lot of modifiers available. Um, we actually created a cheat sheet for you to easily find or somehow group the modifiers available. So check out our documentation for a cheat sheet of uh, all of the modifiers available and what you can actually use in Compose. Great. In the meantime, I got it done. The spacing is showing around the text and it's nice and purple. So just the way we wanted to design it. Cool, awesome. And we actually got uh, one question on, uh, on the live stream. Uh, do we actually need to wrap uh, inside of, uh, our composables always inside the basic code lab theme or is it enough to just do it in the main activity? Um, you don't have to do that. I think uh, in the next step, we'll start uh, seeing how we can reuse composables and we'll start creating multiple composables. And you'll see that you don't have to do this for each of them, uh, but rather um, only the one that's at the top of their hierarchy will have to be wrapped uh, uh, inside the theme. And then that material theme will actually propagate the changes further down. Uh, I won't go more in the, in the theming. Maybe we have time to go uh, over theming towards the end of the code lab. Uh, cool. So right now, Yolanda is just using one composable, so just a greeting. But then with time, the more components you add to your UI, the more levels of nesting you end up creating. Pretty much the same with any other function in your code base. But the problem is that this can affect the readability if a function becomes really large. So by making small reusable components, it's easy to build up a library of UI elements used in your app. And then each one can be responsible for one small part of the screen, and then it can be edited and previewed independently. So let's try it that with our code. And of course, this is just gonna be a tiny extraction of a little bit of code, but indeed when your code gets bigger and bigger, you want to extract code more and more often. So in our case, let ex let's extract most of our uh, app into a composable called my app. So I will use a live template in order to create a composable function. You can also just type this out if you want. And let's call it my app. And inside, let's extract this whole piece, which is a surface and then the greeting inside of it. So I will move this into my app. And instead, I will just call my app directly here. So I, now I did a simple extraction into a separate composable. And this is mostly, this is not going to change anything of our, in our design. But this is mostly to, to demonstrate how you can actually move those composables outside of each other. Cool. So we've learned how to use composable functions and modifiers. We reorganized our code a little bit. In the next section, let's increase the complexity of the UI. So our goal is to create a UI like the one that Yolanda is showing right now. So we have two greetings, buttons, and spacings. So what, what do we need to do to, to build this UI? Where I think we're going to use some more basic composables provided by the library. So we'll use a column, which lays out the children uh, vertically. And then inside the greeting, we will use a row that lays out the children horizontally. Yeah, so let's take a look at the design again. What do we want to do? We want to create these two Hello World and Hello Compose items. And somehow we need to lay them out vertically and then inside, indeed, we want some sort of horizontal alignment. So before we do that, I'm going to make one more change to our code and that's that I'm going to adapt our preview because this one is still calling greeting, but instead we want this to call my app. That way, when we make changes to my app, um, we will actually see those in our preview. We could also add another preview if we want to, like we can choose how we want to uh, create previews for our app. In our case, let's just directly call my app here. So the first thing that I want to do based on the design is I want to break up our Hello Android into Hello World. So like two vertical uh, texts instead. 
And so the first thing that I'm tempted to do is to basically just copy my text and use it again so that I have two texts and then change the first one to be hello comma and then the second one can be just the name, right? So here we will just use the name that's being put into the greeting. Now let's see what that would look like. I think it must look quite nice, but I do see that we have the padding here two times. So probably there will be, oh, actually they're shown on top of each other. That's not what we want. And that's the thing that we mentioned, we want to align them vertically. So what Surface by default does is it behaves like a box, which means that it lays its children on top of each other. And you can align within that box. Uh, but what we want to do is we want to actually lay them out vertically. So we want to surround this with a column. There we go. And now I do expect them to show up on top of each other. So within the column, it basically looks at which composables are here and then just puts them underneath one another. So this starts to look a lot better, but we do see that the padding is now done for each of the texts individually. And I think we might want to move that into the column instead so that the hello Android is nicely snuck together. So let's move this into our column and clean up a little bit. So we can simplify our texts, there we go. And then this modifier can go as well. And as you can see, by just adapting our Kotlin code, we can quite easily change what our design looks like and we can see it directly in Android Studio. I haven't run this app on any device yet. So that's the first thing we wanted to do. I think that looks quite nice. So let's take another look. We want to get to this point. So the next step is let's try to create more than one greeting. And let's try to put in some dynamic data here. So we want to make sure that we can call the greeting with the word with the word world, and we want to call it with the word compose. So for that, we're not going to adapt the greeting itself anymore, but rather we will make changes to the my app composable. So what we can do is we can simply add another greeting here, and instead of using Android, we can use world, and we can use compose. We are, we're doing the same trick as we just did with the texts. So we can surround this with a column again, and then they, those two greetings will show on top of each other. Now, of course, this is fine, but what if we are going to have 10 or 20 of those greetings that wouldn't really scale, right? So what we can actually do is we can put, um, we can put the names into the My App um, Composable as a parameter. So let's give the My App uh, composable a parameter called names, which is a list of strings. This way we can add two or three or whatever we want. And let's give that a default value. So let's say that we're going to pass worlds and we're going to pass compose as the default values here. And instead of like creating this greeting by hand by duplicating it, we will actually be able to surround this with a for loop. So this is just a normal Kotlin construct that we can use. And instead of having to do something fancy, we can easily just use the Coplin for loop. And then it will, for each name in names, it will call the greeting and put it as a child of the column. So now I am still calling this with world. So that would lead to world two times. So let's call it with the name. And then I would expect this to give hello world and hello compose. Now, these will probably have different sizes, as you can see. And that's because by default, this um, column will just use whatever space its children need. So in order to demonstrate that a little bit better, let's for the preview go to a width of 320 pixels, which is kind of like a small device. And if we now scale this, we can see that indeed it nicely snugs that 24 pixels of padding and not anymore. So if we want to change this behavior, we want to modify one of our composables, right? We want to modify our greeting composable. So what we can do is we can use another modifier for this. You guessed right. So in this case, we can use the fill max width modifier, which tells um, Compose to um, use this, basically the full width that is available in the parent container. So let's see what that would look like. So the column now fills the whole width. And because the column is inside the surface and the surface has the background color set, everything will become that same color purple. So that starts to look a little bit better already, but I do see that everything is purple now. And I think in our design, we had some spacings around this. So we want to adapt our composables a little bit more. We want to modify them a little bit more. 
And in our case, we want to add some extra padding surrounding our um, surface. So we can use another modifier for our surface and we can use modifier again, the padding. But as you can see, there's different padding uh, methods here. So we can use all horizontal, uh, start, top, end, etc. We can choose which one. So in our case, what we can do is we can set the horizontal and the vertical value here. So our horizontal could be, for example, 8 dp, and then our vertical could be, uh, let's say, 4 dp. So let's align this and let's run it again and see what that looks like. I'm expecting this to add some spacing to the left and right of each of the greetings, but also a little bit of spacing to the top and bottom. That starts to look quite nice. Now, the only thing I'm missing is a little bit of extra space on the top and the bottom of the whole um, app. So what we can do is we can go back to our My App and we can give this column a bit of extra padding as well. So we can, again, create a modifier here and say, let's do some extra vertical padding of four more dps. And that way, I think we have our spacing down. Now, the only thing that's left is to add the button. So we've only been working with columns so far, so let's try uh, and create a row. Let's see, where would we put the button? It needs to be inside our greeting and inside the surface because it's inside the purple um, rectangle that we have. And then it should be somewhere after the column. So let's add it over here. And I'll just create a button which has an on-click listener set to it. This is a callback and we will actually fill this in later on. Um, so far, we're not dealing with the behavior of the button yet. And inside the button, we can put whatever other composables we want. So in this case, we're just going to add a simple text composable, which will say show more. There we go. Uh, but we can also put like, I don't know, a whole other UI hierarchy again inside that button. So that works quite nicely. And while we do this, I haven't laid out this button in the parent yet. So this button will just be shown right on top of our Hello World um, text. So we probably want to do something special here. Look, it shows just on top of the rest. And you can also see that it currently has a primary color and that's because a default button by default uses the primary color. So we can use the outlines button instead, which is another concept from material design, which will use the surface color as a background. And that will you give us the nice white button that we saw in our design. Now we want to put this in a row as we discussed. So let's put both our column with the text in it and the outlines buttons together inside a row. So I will do another surround with widgets and I will surround this with a row. And this will probably not work yet because we made our column fill the max width. So what this is going to do is the column will fill that whole width and there will be no space left for our button. So instead what we can do is we can actually um, go and let's see, remove that fill max width. There we go. And, but then again, it won't use the full width. So we can use another modifier instead, which is the weight modifier. And the weight modifier, um, you might still remember it from the view system. It tells the parent, the row in this case, that this child, our column, wants to be flexible and it wants to take up any space that it can. Um, but it doesn't want to overlap with other children. So this is making this column a flexible child, while our outline button is not a flexible child. So our outline button will just take the space that it actually needs. And as you can see, this starts looking much better. The only thing is that our button is still aligned quite weird to the right top. And that's because it is our column that still has that 24 pixel padding. And instead we want to move that to the whole row. So let's move it out here. And inside our row, let's add the modifier dot padding with 24 dp. And as you can see, this dot dp actually for us handles the whole density independent pixels, which is quite nice. Um, and this is starting to look like it. I think let's take a quick look at our code lab to see yeah. if this is the same. I think it is. I think we're there. Yeah, yeah, cool, awesome. So we got a question around uh, XML. Is Compose totally XML free or in some corner cases, we still have to use XML? 
Well, UIs are not defining XML anymore. You can just use Kotlin to define your UIs. But apps will still use XML for things like strings, so for these kind of resources. Yeah, and it's also oh. still possible, of course, to, um, in, to interrupt, right? If you still have a lot of XML views and you slowly want to migrate to, uh, to Compose, you can actually still call uh, your XML from within Compose and the other way around. And there's actually a really great other code lab around this, around migrating your app to Compose. And there's actually a code along on migrating to Compose uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I think also things like uh, the Android manifest will still be using XML, of course, but uh, yeah, I think that's a default in Android. Okay, so we've, uh, we're have we starting to to add some more life to our application. Uh, let's, uh, let's do some more. So there is a lot that you can do with composables and modifiers, but for now, we actually haven't added any behavior to, to the app. So let's see how we can expand the greeting when the user clicks the button. So the text inside the button should also change, right? Should we see either show more or show less, depending on, uh, on the state. So before getting into how to make a button clickable and how to resize an item, you need to store uh, some values somewhere that indicates whether each item is expanded or not. So this is the state of the item. Since we need to have one of these values per greeting, the logical place for this is inside the greeting composable. So as I, we mentioned before, Compose apps transform data into UI by calling composable functions. And then if your data changes, Compose re-executes these functions with the new data, creating an updated UI. So this process that I just mentioned now is called recomposition. Compose also looks at what data is needed by an individual composable so that it only needs to recompose components where those data has changed and then skip recomposing the ones that are not affected. This also means that composable functions can execute frequently and in any order. So please don't rely on the ordering in which the code is executed or how many times the function will be recomposed. Okay, Yolanda, let's see how we implement the state in our greeting composable. Yeah, that's a lot of theory, Florina. So yeah. let's see how we could actually implement this. So this is step seven of the code lab. If you got stuck, the bottom of step six has a great code that you can just copy over and then you can continue with us from step seven. And so what our goal is for now is we have this beautiful button that says show more, but we actually want to be able to press it and then it expands our row, it expands our greeting. And then if it, sh it says show less. And then if you click it again, it will change uh, the button again. Uh, and that's how we can actually use state. So let's go into our code and see what would be my most, like my first intuition would be, well, I want to make a variable, which we call, let's call it expanded, and which starts being false because we're not in the expanded state initially. And when I click the button, I want to change that value. So the expanded state would be whatever it wasn't before, right? So I'm negating the value, I'm setting it, and then let's, for demonstration purposes, indeed show more or show less based on that expanded state. So if expanded, I would say show less, and if not, I would say show more. Now, this code actually will not work, so I will quickly run it on my emulator to see if it works, but I can tell you already that it won't. Um, and the reason for that is what Florina just mentioned, is that just setting a value here isn't actually going to do anything. Um, so what we need to do is we need some way to tell Compose that when this value changes, it needs to recompose any composables that depend on that value. And in our case, um, the composable composable that depends on this value is our text because the text changes when the value of that um, variable changes. So in our case, when I just have this button and I press the button, yeah, maybe my expanded variable will actually change to true, but that doesn't mean that this text composable will be recomposed and thus show different text now. So we need some way to, to kind of sig signal to compose that this is a value that it needs to kind of keep an eye out for. And the way we do that is we use the mutable state of. So this is a compose method that we can call with an initial value. 
And that mutable state of signifies um, that this is a value that actually um, needs to recompose its dependence when it changes. So this now returns us a state um, instance instead of just a Boolean. That also means that we cannot just call it like this. We need to actually set uh, and get the value of it. And although this all looks quite nice, as you can see, it already shows us a um, big red line here. And that's because we cannot just use mutable state of, and uh, the warning actually says that we need to use the remember keyword here. And remember is used in compose for another, um, it has another purpose. So let's take a look at what remember does. So let's import it and let's see what it says. So remember, make sure that when this greeting is being recomposed, so not the text that depends on our expanded value, but when this greeting uh, up here is being recomposed because for example, our name changes of, or because of whatever other reason as Farina mentioned, like this can recompose as often as it wants. And remember, make sure that the value that's created inside it will not be reset every time that this composable is being recomposed. So the first time this greeting is being called, which is the initial composition, it creates this mutable state of, but then when the greeting is being recomposed, it doesn't actually do that again. So it doesn't reinitializes it to false. Instead, it just remembers what it had before. So remember is a great name, I would say, for this. And we can actually use the vol keyword here, and that gives us a actual state inside this composable that will actually work. So let's check if this actually does work. I'm running it on my emulator as we speak. So it will reset. And while it's doing so, let's see if clicking the button now actually changes the text that's shown on the button. There we go. So as you can see, when I press show more, it actually changes to show less. So that's amazing. Now, the only thing that we should actually also do here is to change the padding. So let's create a variable called extra padding, which we will make, well, that depends on the expanded value, right? So if this is expanded, then this is going to be, let's say 48 dp and else zero. And again, we have to use the dot value here. There we go. So this extra padding, let's set it to, I don't know, the column can use that extra padding and then set it only to the bottom of the column. So there we go, we can set it to that extra padding. Let's realign this a little bit, there we go. And let's run and see if this actually works. So one thing that you might notice is that I'm not using the remember value here. So that means that every time our greeting is being recomposed, if you remember correctly, then this variable will be recalculated as well, even though maybe our expanded state didn't really change. Now in this scenario, we're just doing simple if else statement. So this is not a very complex calculation, but if this calculation would be way more complex and would take more CPU cycles, then we could actually opt to also put this inside a remember block. Let's see what this looks like. And indeed we can see that now the padding nicely expands and collapses. So we have state. Cool. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. So in the state of the, in the case of the expandable greeting, our state lives there inside that greeting composable. And you can write and read the value of the expanded state only inside that one composable. So there's no need to know about the state anywhere else because this is really specific to the group. But in general, state that is read or modified by multiple functions should live uh, in a common ans uh, ancestor. So in a function that calls the greeting. And this process of, uh, of moving the state somewhere higher is called state hoisting. And then hoist means to lift or to elevate. Making state hoistable avoids duplicating state and introduces introducing bugs and also helps us reuse composables. And then it just make, com makes composables substantially easier to test. Contrarily, state that doesn't need to be controlled by a composable's parent should not be hoisted. Uh, which is the case for, for the grouping. So keep in mind that the source of truth belongs to whoever creates and controls that state. So in the next section, what are we going to do? Uh, we want to build an onboarding screen. 
So whether we want to show the onboarding screen or the greeting screen will depend on some state as well. So how do we do this? Well, let's first start by copying over the code for this onboarding screen. We've already uh, dived quite deep into designing screens, so I will quickly just copy over the implementation here. And you can do the same if you're following along. So let's copy over what we have, and we will quickly walk through this. I will put it below our greeting and above our preview. So let's put it over here. Let's see. Oh, I didn't copy it correctly. There we go. So what are we doing here? Well, you can see at the bottom that we're creating another preview. This time we're setting the width and the height. So while we're going, let's hide that emulator for a bit and let's take a look at that preview. There are still some errors here because we have to add some imports. And let's see. So we want to import get value and mutable state of. And then we also want to import set value. There we go. We want to import fill max size. That's close to the fill max width we used before. There's an arrangement, an alignment, all of these setting certain values for our design. And I think that's about it for our imports. So let's take a quick look at this. The first thing that I'm noticing is that here I see, again, that same concept of remember mutable state of, in this case, setting the default to true. But here I see something else that we didn't see before. I see the by keywords. And maybe Florina, do you want to explain what the by keyword does? Sure, sure. So, um... It's using delegates, right? So in this case, uh, when we would be using uh, should show onboarding, we no longer use the dot value like we are in the greeting. Um, actually, can we can we change the um, the remember and the way we use remember in the greeting? Yeah. So yeah. Let's here. Let's use by. Let's see what happens. Uh, I think we'll need to use a var as well, or. And then now we can just remove the dot value. So let's yeah. take all the dot values that we had. There yeah. we go. And then, uh, yeah, using property delegates in Kotlin allows us to simplify the code a little bit. Thank you. That actually looks a lot better. So I was already getting annoyed with writing that dot value everywhere. So I'm, I'm happy that we got this uh, fixed. Okay, so that was the first thing I saw here. There's a big to do here, which we will get to later. And let's take a quick look at our design. You can see that we have a surface again. Um, so that was the container from material design. Then we have a column in this case, which is filling as much space as it can. So in our preview, we can see that that is 320 by 320 pixels. And it is using a vertical arrangement and a horizontal alignment. So vertically, what, it's, what this column is doing is it's trying to center all of its children in the center of the column. And then horizontally, every child within the column will also be centered. So in the end, that leads to this result, which is our text and our button nicely in the middle of our uh, container. And as you can see, there is a little bit of spacing between our button and our text. And again, we're doing that using the padding modifier. And one more thing that you see here in the button is that we have this on click uh, parameter again. And that on click parameter itself gets a method gets a function actually and so this is a callback which actually tells the button so that when it gets clicked it should call this function and it should execute what's happening inside so in this case we're setting the should show onboarding uh, value to false so that's what this currently looks like but we just have the onboarding preview but if i run my app we're not actually going to see this onboarding because this onboarding screen is not used anywhere so in order to use it, I think we would have to make changes to my app. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna actually change the name of my app to greetings, uh, because this, is, this was our column, which had a list of greetings inside. And then we will create a new my app composable. So again, I'm using the live templates here and creating a new my app uh, function and inside, I will have some sort of logic to either show the onboarding screen or show the greeting screen. 
So it will be something like if should show onboarding, if we want to show the onboarding, then we will call the onboarding screen and else we will call the greetings screen. Now, this is the state that Freyne was mentioning, right? Like, do we want to show the onboarding, yes or no? So that for that we had inside our onboarding screen actually doesn't really belong there. So this to do, let's hoist this state and let's move it to the point where it actually needs to be read. In our case, that is the My App Composable. So I'm just moving our var in there. Now, this reads the should show onboarding, but how do we set this value? The most um, intuitive or the, the easiest way that you might want to do is, is to pass our state into our onboarding screen composable. However, this is not what we want to do. We want to make sure that our composables are uh, clean and like black boxes. So you shouldn't be putting in state that you then change from within that composable. Instead, what we do is the same as we did for the button, we actually pass in a callback. In our case, we can create a callback called on continue clicked and give it um, that actual callback, which then would set our should show onboarding to false. Now, this actually isn't a parameter yet, so edit, let's add it to our onboarding screen. So inside we can say uh, on continue clicked. This is a um, function. So this is our way to define in Kotlin that this thing is a function. So we're passing a function, and in this case, a callback, because this is being called from within this composable. And so this callback can actually be removed, and instead, we just forward that on continue clicked here. And now, if we would run this app, inside our emulator, we should be able to work with this. I do see that there is still an issue here. So in our preview, we're not passing anything for that on continue clicked value. So Let's pass something. Well, in our preview, we don't really want to act on this, right? Like nothing should change. We just want to show the onboarding screen. So we can pass an empty callback here. So I think that fixes it. And in the meantime, let's spin up that emulator again and see what this behaves like. So we are opening the app. So let's go all the way back to the top. We're opening my app. And inside my app, we have this state, which starts as true. We should be showing the onboarding, which means that this if else is being evaluated. And so instead of hiding things from our composition, we're actually just uh, dynamically showing certain composables, yes or no. So we're adding composables to our composition and we're, we're removing them whenever we're done with them. So in this case, um, whenever this value changes, this if else statement is being re-evaluated. And if the value changes from true to false, then this will just not be called anymore, which means that the onboarding screen composable will leave the composition and instead the greetings um, composable will be added. So let's see if that actually works. So in our emulator, when we press the continue button, it calls the on continue clicked callback. And there we go, it shows our greetings composable. Now, in this case, we're using a basic Boolean value to work with this. Of course, in a, a bigger app, you might want to start working with uh, the navigation library, um, but this is just to show you like how um, your app can actually work with state on a higher level. Cool. Uh, actually, I want to point out one thing you've, you've done here. So when you copy pasted the code for the onboarding, you also copy pasted the preview. And that's something that's really cool. If you if you switch back to the preview, we see that the, we can actually have multiple previews in the same file. And actually, even for the same composable, we can have multiple previews. And to be honest, I find this so neat because you know you don't have to go all the way to the app and navigate to I don't know the greeting screen to be able to see how that looks. You can just uh, use the preview, and yeah, it's easier to to debug your code. Shall we add another one? Oh, we yeah. can add another preview just on top of this one. So I'm just literally duplicating the first one. And for this one, for example, we can use, I am winging this one because I'm not 100% sure. Oh no, this show system. No, I mean, actually the- The dark mode, the it? UI mode, right? Yes, UI mode, there you go. So this should be 
UI mode. Yes, so we can actually show our dark theme inside here. And let's rebuild that and see what that looks like. So for the onboarding preview, I just added another preview annotation. And I'm adding the UI mode night, which means that we're actually showing the dark mode here. And let's minify this a little bit. There uh, we go. There we go. I, I find so, this so neat. Um, so we got some uh, some questions uh, on the live chat. So someone is saying that they're a little bit confused that it looks like they we don't have separation of concerns anymore. Uh, that's true for this code lab. Keep in mind that here we're just showing like really, really the first steps with using Compose. So it's it's normal. Um, but we actually have more content that shows you separation of concerns and how to use state much more in depth. So check out our other collabs and documentation. Um, yeah, Can so I it, add one thing to that? Yes, please, yes, I think please. what I wanted to say is like, if you're being uh, more advanced and if you're starting to create a bigger app, Compose is just a UI layer, right? So there is still there still will be view models, there will still be repositories, you will still build your Android app the way you were used to, uh, but you're changing the UI layer and you will be interacting with that view model in order to get your data and then show it in your UI layer. Um, someone else is saying that they're an Android the Kotlin beginner and they're in the progress of completing a pathway from 2020, which uses XML for uh, activities. And they're asking us if it's recommended to avoid XML and use Compose instead. Well, truth be told, I think you'll see uh, XML in, uh, in apps for, for a long time, especially once you switch companies and so on. Uh, but I think it's a good way to learn both XML because probably apps will have to maintain for a while XML, but also keep an eye on Compose, which as we can see, it's starting to be adopted quite fast. I think we already see uh, ten tens of th thousands of apps, so more than 10,000 apps on Play Store um, using Compose. Actually, even the Play Store itself uses Compose, but that's a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so we went through, through several things, um, but Yolanda, what do you think if, uh, how about showing a list? Uh, we use Recycler for this, right? Yes, indeed. So we've been showing, so far we've been showing two greetings, right? So we had just the hello world and the hello compose. So let's spice things up a little bit and let's, you know, make a list of a thousand elements. And I'm going to warn you, if you're coding along, don't run this on an emulator yet because your computer might get a little bit hot. Um, but let's code and see, let's create a list of a thousand elements. And we can use the list builder here. And we can say that for each uh, one of those thousand, we're going to create a string. In this case, just using it, which is uh, the value of the index. So this will create a string with the number zero, with the number one, two, et cetera, all the way up to 999. And if we would run this, then this for loop would start doing a lot, right? So it would actually go through a thousand values and for all of those create this greeting composable. That's a little too much. Like composables are cheap to create, but not that cheap. So we do want to be a little bit careful here. And so instead of using this for loop, we can actually move to something else, which is called a lazy column. So the word lazy already kind of maybe gives it away a little bit. The lazy column only um, renders those composables, only uh, creates those composables that are currently in the screen. So that are currently shown on screen. So what we can do inside the lazy column, instead of directly creating those greetings in there, we can use the items call. There's also, you could create one item or you can create more than one. In our case, we want to create more than one, right? So for each of our names, we want to create a greeting. So we can use items greeting here, and then there we go. We can say for each of our names, we will call that name and then we will call the greeting for that. So this is actually using a DSL, which is a very complicated way of saying that this isn't, isn't directly calling composables, but it uses items, or if you want item is also an option, or you can work with index items in here. And that's all um, tied to that lazy column. The same way, by the way, you could also create a lazy row. 
So let's run this on our emulator and see what that lazy column will do. So now it's safe again. You can run it just how you want. Um, so let's see. Let's spin up our emulator and see what that list would look like. Ah, uh, so no more recycle view, no more adapter to write. I can actually be lazy. You can actually be quite lazy. Yeah, that's true. So let's see if this actually works. Yeah, there we go. So we have a huge list here. And for each one of those, I can open, expand them, and I can collect, collapse them again. So just to show you a little bit more of the strength of that, we can also say that, you know, we want to get some header here. So we will just say that we want to show a text which says header here. Or if we want to, we can actually even work with sticky headers. And there's quite some fancy functionality in here. And so this just adding that item here with whatever composable you want inside um, will actually give us the ease of mind to work uh, with that lazy column and add it to the top. So as you can see here now, we can see that there now is a header and it just scrolls along with the rest. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so that'll come. Uh, oh, should we see how we persist uh, state? Yeah, because you might have noticed already that every time, well, of course, every time I run the app again, it starts in the onboarding view. But actually, um, when we would rotate our screen um, or when we would move to dark mode, so let's go into our list and let's, as a demonstration, go to dark mode instead. Actually, what it does, it, it, it will actually reload our activity. So that's something that happens if your configuration changes. Um, what actually happens is that your uh, activity will be reloaded. And currently in our app, that leads to that um, composable being recalled again on the highest level. And thus we're back in uh, the original my app, which then instantiates the first time this mutable state to true. So we see the onboarding again. And that's not what we want, right? If we, if you rotate your screen or if you um, change the dark theme, then we want to be able to remember where we were. And this is actually quite easy. So we were using the remember keyword here, but instead we can choose to re remember savable. And remember savable is simply going to remember the value that's inside, but also contain it over configuration changes. So if we now run the app and we go to into our list and then we rotate our screen, or if we move back to light mode, then I would actually expect that to stay in the list and not go back to the onboarding. So let's see that in action. Let's continue to the list and let's scroll a little bit and then let's change back into our light theme again. There we go. And there we go. We're still on our list. So this is just one change in a word here and that made it survive configuration changes. Okay. How about putting some life in the in our app and add some animations. Oh, yes, let's add animations. I think I would love to add an animation for our expanding action because our expanding action is now simply setting that value to 48, I think, and zero, but we can animate that value. So let's go into our greeting because that's where we were setting the expanded value. And inside our extra padding, instead of just setting that to 48 or to zero, we can use an animation here. And there's all kinds of um, different abstractions for animations. In this case, we will be using quite a low level one, but it's still quite simple to understand. And um, we will use animate, um, animate DPS state. So this is doing um, something similar to what we were doing before is it actually there we go. Wait, let me quickly finish this up. Mm, nope, almost, almost, almost. We, of course, have to set the target value to this value. Sorry, I was so enthusiastic about all the blocks of code everywhere, but this just needs to be a regular round bracket. So the target value you set to 48 or 0 dB. But what actually happens is this animate DPS state will return a state, which is the same as we had for our expanded value. And so we can also do the same with property delegation. So we can use by here. And that way, 
now what happens is that if you set this value, so if expanded changes from false to true, then this target value will change from 0 dp into 48 dp. And the animate dp as state will start emitting new values in that state um, construct um, every single frame, I guess. And then that extra padding will be updated. So it starts at zero, but then it will go to one to two, etc., cetera, um, until it is in, at 48 dp. And every single time our column will be updated with this new padding. And so if we run this, we should be able to see that now this expands with a nice animation. There's one small last thing we can do here as well as we can actually define an animation spec here. So you can quickly customize. So there is a default animation spec, which in our app we can see by pressing show more, show less. As you can see, it is now nicely animates. But you can also use an animation spec here. So for example, you can use a tween which goes linearly from one to the next. And we can set how long we want this to take, for example. So we can say, the duration is 2000 milliseconds. So now this will take two seconds to run. And this way there's different types of animation specs that you can work with. Um, you can create easily like springs or bounces or whatever, however you want to animate your things. So now it's a slow animation. Yeah. Oh. But honestly saying that you know, you wrote four lines of code to implement an animation and customize it. I don't, yeah, I really like it. I, I can be really lazy. Cool. Uh, do we have anything wanted to show for animations? I think this is it. I think that's it. Cool. Uh, I think I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up. Um, if you switch to the code lab, we can see that we have one more section that we didn't get to, uh, or like theming and then a few final touches. Uh, we promise styling and theming, uh, is is easy, but we can't cover it in just just three minutes. Um, if you want to learn more about Compose, uh, we have a Compose pathway. Uh, do we have the, the link at hand? Uh, yes, Wanda? it's in the code lab actually. Awesome, great. Yeah, uh, check out the Compose pathway. We have a lot of resources for you uh, to get started with Compose. Uh, similarly, we have a lot of documentation on our developer.android.com and because I know you want to try things on uh, more. We have another Compose, uh, the migrate, migrating to Compose uh, code along tomorrow. And also tomorrow we have an Ask Android uh, focused on Compose and material use. So bring all of your Compose questions to that Ask Android. And I think this is it for now. Thank you everyone for watching and for following along. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hi everyone, today Jose and I want to bring the reactive programming concept close to Android development. Then we'll see how to work with Flow, Kotlin type for modeling streams of data. As Android has a particular UI lifecycle, we'll see how to optimize flows for things like rotations and sending the app to the background. And lastly, as with all good stories, we need to test that everything works as expected. Every Android app needs to send data around one way or another, and there are a million different use cases. Loading a username from a database, fetching a document from a server, authenticating a user. In this talk, we'll look at how you can load data into a flow, transform it, and expose it to a view so that it's displayed. To help me explain why we use flow, here's Pancho. Pancho lives on a mountain. And when Pancho wants fresh water from a lake, they do what any beginner would do. They grab a bucket and walk up to the lake and down again. But sometimes Pancho finds that the lake is dry, so they wasted time walking up to the lake as they have to find water elsewhere. After doing this multiple times, they realize it would be much better to create some kind of infrastructure. So the next time they walk up to the lake, they install some pipes. Now, if they need more water and the lake is not dry, they just open the tap. Once you know how to install pipes, it's easy to get fancy and combine multiple sources of data, sorry, water, so that Pancho doesn't have to check if the lake is dry anymore. In an Android app, you can take the easy path and request data every time you need it. For example, 
When the view starts, you request data to a view model, which in turn requests data to the data layer, and then everything happens in the other direction. You can do this easily with suspend functions. However, after doing that for a while, developers like Pancho tend to realize investing in some infrastructure really pays out. Instead of requesting data, we observe it. Observing data is like installing tubes for water. Once they're in place, any update to the source of data will flow down to the view automatically. You don't have to walk to the lake anymore. We call a system that uses these patterns reactive because observers react automatically to changes in the things being observed. Another important design choice is to keep data flowing in just one direction, as this is less prone to errors and easier to manage. In this example app, the auth manager tells the database that a user logged in, and this one in turn has to tell the remote data source to load a different set of items, all of this while telling the view to show a loading spinner while they grab new data. I mean, this is doable, but prone to bugs. A better way to do this is to let data flow in just one direction and create some infrastructure, some tubes, to combine and transform these streams of data. If something changes that requires modifications, such as when the user logs out, the tubes can be reinstalled. As you can imagine, we need sophisticated tools to do all these combinations and transformations. And in this talk, we're going to use Kotlin Flow for that. It's not the only streams builder out there, but it's part of coroutines and very well supported. The stream of water analogy we've been using so far can be modeled in a concrete type called Flow, a type that is part of the coroutines library. Instead of water, flows can be of any type T, for example, user data or UI state. There is some terminology we'll be using during the talk that is important to define. A producer emits data into the flow that a consumer collects from the flow. In Android, a data source or repository is typically a producer of application data that has the UI as the consumer that ultimately displays the data on screen. Let's start with how flows are created. For that, let's take a walk to the lake. Most of the time, you don't need to create a flow yourself. The libraries you depend on in your data sources are already integrated with coroutines and flows. This is the case of popular libraries such as Data Store, Retrofit, Room, or Work Manager. They act like a water dam. They provide you data using flows. You just plug into a pipe without knowing how the data is being produced. Taking Room as an example, you can get notified of changes in the database by exposing a flow of type X. The Room library acts as a producer and emits the content of the query every time an update happens. If you really need to create a flow yourself, there are different alternatives you can choose. One of the options is the Flow Builder. Imagine that we are in a user messages data source and you want to check for messages every so often from your app. We can expose the user messages as a flow of type list of messages. To create a flow, we use the flow builder. The flow builder takes a suspend block as a parameter, which means it can call suspend functions. And this is because the flow is executed in the context of a coroutine. Inside it, we can have a while through loop to repeat our logic periodically. First, we fetch the messages from the API, and then we add the result into the flow using the init suspend function. This step suspends the coroutine until the collector receives the item. Lastly, we suspend the coroutine for some time. In a flow, operations are executed sequentially in the same coroutine. Due to the while through loop, this flow keeps infinitely fetching the latest messages until the observer goes away and stops collecting items. Also, the suspend block passed to the flow builder is often called producer block. In Android, layers in between the producer and consumer can modify the stream of data to adjust it to the requirements of the following layer. To transform flows, you can use intermediate operators. If we consider the latest messages stream as the flow starting point, 
we can use the map operator to transform the data to a different type. For example, inside the map lambda, we are transforming the raw messages coming from the data source to a messages UI model that is a better abstraction for this layer of the app. Each operator creates a new flow that emits data according to its functionality. We can also filter the stream to get a flow for those messages that contain important notifications. Now, how can we handle errors that happen as part of the stream? The catch operator catches exceptions that could happen while processing items in the upstream flow. The upstream flow refers to the flow produced by the producer block and those operators called before the current one. Similarly, we can refer to the everything that happens after the current operator as the downstream flow. Catch can also rethrow the exception if needed or emit new values. For example, this code rethrows illegal argument exceptions, but emits an empty list if any other exception occurs. At this point, we've seen how streams are produced and how they can be modified. It's time to learn about how to collect them. Collecting flows usually happens from the UI layer, as it is where we want to display the data on the screen. In our example, we want to display the latest messages on a list so that Pancho can keep up with what's going on. We need to use a terminal operator to start listening for values. To get all the values in the stream as they are limited, use collect. Collect takes a function as a parameter that is called on every new value. And as it is a suspend function, it needs to be executed within a coroutine. When you apply a terminal operator to a flow, the flow is created on demand and starts emitting values. On the contrary, Intermediate operators just set up a chain of operations that are executed lazily when an item is emitted into the flow. Every time collect is called on user messages, a new flow, or pipe, will be created and its producer block will start refreshing the messages from the API at its own interval. In Coroutine's jargon, we refer to this type of flows as called flows, as they are created on demand and emit data only when they are being observed. Let's see now how to optimally collect flows from the Android UI. There are two main things to consider. The first one is about not wasting resources when the app is in the background, and the second one is about configuration changes. Let's imagine we are in messages activity and we want to display the list of messages on the screen. For how long should we be collecting from the flow? The UI should be a good citizen and stop collecting from the flow when the UI is not displayed on the screen. Back to the water analogy, Pancho should close the tap while brushing their teeth or going for a nap. Pancho shouldn't be wasting water. Similarly, the UI shouldn't be collecting from flows if the information isn't going to be displayed on the screen. To do this, there are different alternatives and all of them are aware of the UI lifecycle. You can use live data or lifecycle coroutine specific APIs such as repeat on lifecycle and flow with lifecycle. The as live data flow operator converts the flow to live data that observes items only while the UI is visible on the screen. This conversion is something we can do in the view model class. In the UI, we just consume the live data as usual. But okay. This is cheating a bit because it's adding a different technology into the mix, which shouldn't be needed. Repeat on lifecycle is the recommended way to collect flows from the UI layer. Repeat on lifecycle is a suspend function that takes a lifecycle state as a parameter. This API is lifecycle aware as it automatically launches a new coroutine with the block passed to it when the lifecycle reaches that state. Then, when the lifecycle falls below that state, the ongoing coroutine is cancelled. Inside the block, we can call collect as we are in the context of a coroutine. As repeat on lifecycle is a suspend function, it also needs to be called in a coroutine. As we are in an activity, we can use lifecycle scope to start one. As you can see, the best practice is to call this function when the lifecycle is initialized. For example, in onCreate in this activity. 
Repeat on life cycles resartable behavior takes into account the UI lifecycle automatically for you. Something important to notice is that the coroutine that calls repeat on life cycle won't resume executing until the life cycle is destroyed. So, if you need to collect from multiple flows, you should create multiple coroutines using launch inside the repeat on life cycle block. You can also use the flow with life cycle operator instead of repeat on life cycle when you have only one flow to collect. This API emits items and cancels the underlying producer when the life cycle moves in and out of the target state. To show how this works visually, let's take a tour through the activity lifecycle when it's first created, then sent to the background because the user pressed the home button, which makes the activity receive the onstop signal, and then opening the app again when onstart is called. When you call repeat on lifecycle with the start state, the UI processes flow emissions while it's visible on the screen, and the collection is cancelled when the app goes to the background. Repeat on lifecycle and flow with lifecycle are new APIs added in the stable 2.4 version of the lifecycle runtime KDX library. Because they are new, you might be collecting flows from the Android UI in a different way. For example, you might be collecting directly from a coroutine launched by lifecycle scope. While this might seem okay to use, collecting flows in this way is not always safe. This collects from the flow and updates UI elements, even if the app is in the background. In fact, this is not the only case. Other solutions like the Lifecycle Coroutine Scope Launch When X API family suffer from similar problems. You don't like Pancho wasting water, do you? Then we shouldn't be collecting from the flow if those items aren't going to be displayed on the screen. If you collect directly from lifecyclescope.launch, the activity keeps receiving flow updates while in the background. That can be both wasteful and dangerous, as for example, showing dialogues when the app is in the background can make your application crash. To solve this issue, you could manually start collecting in on start and stop collecting in on stop. While that's okay, using repeat on lifecycle removes all that boilerplate code. If we look at launch when started as an alternative, it is better than lifecyclescope.launch because it suspends the flow collection while the app is in the background. However, this solution keeps the flow producer active, potentially emitting items in the background that can fill the memory with items that aren't going to be displayed on the screen. As the UI doesn't really know how the flow producer is implemented, it is always better to play safe and use repeat on lifecycle or flow with lifecycle to avoid collecting items and keeping the flow producer active while the UI is in the background. If this optimizes flow collection when the app goes to the background, Jose is going to tell you some tricks for when the app goes through configuration changes. When you expose a flow to a view, you have to take into account that you are trying to pass data between two elements that have different life cycles. And not any life cycle, the life cycle of activities and fragments, which can be tricky. As a crucial example, remember that when a device is rotated or receives a configuration change, all activities might be restarted, but a view model survives that. So from a view model, you can't just expose any flow. For example, a call flow like this one. A call flow restarts every time it's collected for the first time. So the repository would be called again after a rotation. What we need is some kind of buffer, something that can hold data and share it between multiple collectors, no matter how many times they are recreated. Stateflow was created for exactly that. A state flow is a water tank in our lake analogy. It holds data even if there are no collectors. You can collect multiple times from it, so it's safe to use with activities or fragments. You could use the mutable version of Stateflow and update its value whenever you want, for example, from a coroutine like in here. But that's not very reactive, is it? Pancho would suggest you improve your game. Instead, you can convert any flow to a state flow. If you do that, the state flow receives all the updates from the upstream flows and stores the latest value. And it can have zero or more collectors, so this is perfect for view models. 
There are more types of flows, but this is what we recommend because we can optimize state flow very precisely. To convert a flow to a state flow, you can use the state in operator on it. It takes three parameters. Initial value, because a state flow always needs to have a value. A coroutine scope, which controls when the sharing is started. Uh, we can use the view model scope for this. And started, which is the interesting one. We're going to get to what that while subscribe 5000 means. But first, let's look at two scenarios. The first scenario is a rotation, where the activity, which is the collector of the flow, is destroyed for a short period of time and then recreated. The second scenario is a navigation to home, where our app is put in the background. In the rotation scenario, we don't want to restore any flows to make the transition as fast as possible. In the navigation to home, however, we want to stop all flows to save battery and other resources. So how do we detect which one is which? We do that with a timeout. When a state flow stops being collected, we don't immediately stop all the upstream flows. Instead, we wait for some time, for example, five seconds. If the flow is collected again before the timeout, no upstream flows are canceled. That is exactly what the while subscribe 5000 does. In this diagram, we show what happens when the app goes to the background. Before the home button is pressed, the view is receiving updates and the state flow has its upstream flows producing normally. Now, when the view stops, the collection ends immediately. However, the state flow, because of how we configured it, takes five seconds to stop its upstream flows. Now the timeout passes and upstream flows are canceled. Only when the user opens the app again, if that ever happens, the upstream flows are automatically restarted. In the rotation scenario, however, the view is only stopped for a very short time, less than five seconds anyway. So the state flow never gets to restart and keeps all upstream flows active, acting as though nothing happened and making the rotation instant to the user. So in summary, we recommend that you use state flow to expose your flows from a view model or keep using as like data, which does exactly the same thing. If you want to learn even more about state flow or its parent shared flow, check out the resources at the end. Now, you might be wondering, how do I test this? Well, testing a flow can get tricky because you're dealing with streams of data. So there are a couple of tricks you can use. First, there are two scenarios. In the first one, the unit under test, whatever you're testing, is receiving a flow. The easy way to test this is to replace the dependency with a fake producer. You would program this fake repository in this example to emit whatever you need for the different test cases. For example, with a simple call flow. The test itself would make assertions on the output of the subject under test, which is a flow or something else. Secondly, if the unit under test is exposing a flow and that value or stream of values is what you want to verify, you have multiple ways to collect it. You can call the first method on the flow, and this is going to collect until it receives the first item and then stop collecting. But also you can use operators such as take five and call the to list terminal operator to collect exactly five messages, which can be useful. Hopefully in this talk, you've learned why a reactive architecture is a good investment and how to build your infrastructure with Kotlin Flow. If you feel inspired, we have a ton of content around this, a guide that covers the basics and blog posts where we do deep dives on some topics. Also, if you want to see all of this in context, check out the Google IO app, which we updated earlier this year to include flows everywhere. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Ivan, a software engineer on the Android Studio team, and I'm joined today by Scott, who is also an engineer on the Android Studio team. We're going to talk about how you can benefit from the latest changes in Android Gradle Plugin 7.0 in order to improve your build. We're going to talk about the performance improvements in AGP, steps required to benefit from Gradle configuration cache, and how you can extend AGP using the APIs we added in 7.0. Let's start with the performance improvements. Kotlin Symbol Processing, KSP, brings first-class support for annotation processing for Kotlin, replacing KPT. Using KSP benefits build speed as annotation processors can run up to two times faster compared to KPT. 
There are already popular annotation processors that offer KSP-compatible versions, such as Room and Moshi, with more coming. If all of the annotation processors that you use support KSP, make sure to migrate from KPT Gradle plugin to KSP Gradle plugin. To learn more, please visit this link. With non-transitive R classes enabled, R class includes only the resources declared in the subproject itself and none from its dependencies, thereby reducing the size of the R class for that subproject. The scenario where this is very helpful is when you add a new resource in a runtime dependency, because we are now able to avoid recompiling downstream modules. This incremental scenario improves by 40% with non-transitive R classes enabled. For clean builds, we are seeing 5 to 10% improvement. You can add this flag in your gradle.properties file, but we've also added refactoring help in Arctic Fox. You can run refactor, migrate to non-transitive R classes from the IDE, which adds the right flag to your build and modified sources, if needed. Android X libraries are already using this feature, and the AAR stage ship do not contain resources from transitive dependencies anymore. There have been several recent Lint performance improvements. Since AGP 7.0, Lint tasks can be up to date, and Lint analysis tasks can now run in parallel per module when check dependencies is set to true. Since AGP 7.1 Alpha 13, the Lint analysis task is compatible with the Gradle build cache. To demonstrate the performance improvements, we ran Lint on a project with 15 modules, with check dependencies set to true and Gradle caching enabled. As shown here, we see about a two times improvement from AGP 4.2 with an even more dramatic improvement in AGP 7.1 when all the Lint analysis tasks have cache hits. You might see Lint performance improvements without any action on your part after updating AGP, but there are some simple things you can try to further improve Lint's performance. To benefit from the Lint analysis task being cacheable, you'll need to have the Gradle build cache enabled. You can enable the build cache by adding this flag to your gradle.properties file. Please see this link for some caveats to consider when enabling the Gradle build cache. Another action item is to try the performance tuning in the Android Lint user guide including making sure you've given Lint enough memory. The final action item is to try setting check dependencies to true in your application Lint options block. This won't make Lint run faster, but it will allow Lint to catch more issues and will produce a single Lint report for your entire project. Now, let's talk about Gradle configuration cache. At the beginning of every build, Gradle creates a task graph which is used to execute build operations. We call this configuration phase, and it may take from a couple of seconds to tens of seconds. Configuration cache is a Gradle feature that allows caching the output of the configuration phase of the build and reusing that state in subsequent builds. When there is a configuration cache hit, all tasks run in parallel and dependency resolution results are cached, resulting in further improvements. Please note that this is different from the Gradle build cache, which is used to cache task output. Your build setup fully defines the result of configuration phase of the build. Configuration cache captures those inputs, for example, Gradle properties and the content of your build files. This, together with the tasks you requested to run, uniquely determines the tasks you'll execute in the build. To illustrate the improvements this feature provides, let's take a look at a Gradle build with 24 subprojects using the latest versions of Kotlin, Gradle, and AGP. You can see three different scenarios, clean build, incremental build that adds a public method, and incremental build that modifies method body. In all scenarios, we are seeing 20% build speed improvement. Let's take a closer look at how configuration cache works. Before the task graph is computed, we are in the configuration phase. We are using Gradle-provided global objects, such as project, task container, configuration container, to create tasks with declared inputs and outputs, as in this example, where we register a task and configure it. In this script, we can see multiple usages of global objects like project.tasks and project.configurations. That's perfectly fine as we are still configuring the build. Once all tasks are fully configured, Gradle computes the final task graph. Configuration cache stores this task graph and it serializes the task state and saves it in cache. All task inputs need to be of specific Gradle types or serializable. Finally, when there is a configuration cache hit, stored configuration cache entries are used to create task instances. Only state that has been previously serialized can be referenced in the newly instantiated tasks, and no references to global state are allowed. 
To check if your build is compatible with Configuration Cache, in Arctic Fox, we added a Build Analyzer check. After the build, open the Build Analyzer panel and you will see how long build configuration takes. In this example, it is 9.8 seconds. Click Optimize this link and it will take you to another panel that has more detailed information. In this particular example, all plugins are already compatible and clicking Try Configuration Cache in a build starts a flow after which my Gradle.properties file was updated and a flag to enable configuration cache was added. Build Analyzer may also suggest updating the plugins to a newer version that is compatible with configuration cache. In case your build is incompatible with configuration cache, build will fail and debugging information will be provided. Let's take a look at the following incompatible example. Here we have a task that computes current git SHA and writes it to an output file. It runs the git command, captures its output, and writes the value to a file. Running the task with configuration cache enabled shows two configuration cache problems. When your build is incompatible with configuration cache, Gradle will generate an HTML file which contains a list of issues with more information. If we open the HTML report, we can see stack traces pointing to the issues. In this case, they point to lines 5 and 11 in the build script. Going back to the task source, we can see that we have project access in the function that returns the file output location. That's the first reported issue. The second issue is usage of project in the task action. This is the global state that we cannot access with configuration cache enabled. Let's see how we can fix this. We can store pieces of information that we need in task properties, and those will be stored in the configuration cache. Also, we can rely on Gradle injected services that allow us to execute external processes. Here is a version of the task that is compatible with configuration cache. We captured the output location in a property that we configured during task registration, and the injected Gradle service is used to launch the git command. This is how we can use the new task in our build. The output location is set during task registration. As a plus, Gradle lazy properties are live and any changes to the project build directory will be automatically reflected in the output location of the task. To learn more about configuration cache, please check out Gradle documentation and this article which describes how to migrate your build. Thanks, Ivan. Now we'll take a look at extending the Android Gradle plugin. Many of you have probably wanted your build to do something that wasn't supported by AGP out of the box. In this section, we'll discuss the new Variant and Artifact APIs we've added to help you modify your build safely. Before diving into the Variant and Artifact APIs, let's clarify what Variant and Artifact mean. Build types and product flavors should be familiar concepts to you from your build.gradle files. AGP creates variant objects from these build types and product flavors, and for each variant, AGP produces variant-specific tasks. The outputs of these tasks are registered as artifacts of the corresponding variant. Most of these intermediate artifacts are private, but some are now public. Previous versions of AGP allowed API access to its tasks, but this was brittle because the tasks are an implementation detail and subject to change. AGP 7.0 instead allows API access to the variant object and some intermediate artifacts to allow users to influence the build's behavior without touching the tasks. Now we'll walk through the details of an example project using the new Variant and Artifact APIs to modify an intermediate artifact, add a custom element to the DSL, and add a custom property to the Variant API. We'll be working in the build source directory to create a custom Gradle plugin which accomplishes these goals. The source code for this toy project is compatible with AGP 7.1 Beta 1 and is available at this link. First, we'll focus on modifying an intermediate artifact. Specifically, we'll add an extra asset to the APK by modifying the assets artifact. To achieve this, we'll first need a custom task, like the add asset task shown here. This task has a single string input and a single directory property output. The task writes the input string to a file in the output directory. Using the variant and artifact APIs, we register an instance of our add asset task and wire it to the assets artifact. That's all that's required to get the extra asset into the APK. This block of code is the key. It adds the task's output directory to the collection of asset directories and wires the task dependencies properly. As it's written here, we're hard coding the content of the extra asset. But in later slides, we'll change this behavior to allow us to set this content per variant. AGP now allows users to interact with several different intermediate artifacts. 
some of which are shown here. In our toy example, we appended to the assets artifact, but AGP supports interacting with these artifacts in several other ways. For example, you might want to verify the contents of one of these artifacts, which you can do by getting the artifact, as shown here for the AAR artifact. For more ideas and examples of how to interact with these intermediate artifacts, please check out the new APIs in the Android Gradle plugin blog post on Medium. Getting back to our toy project, now we'd like to add some DSL to allow us to set the content of the extra asset. AGP has recently added the ability to add DSL for a custom plugin to AGP's existing DSL. We'll use this feature to allow setting the content of the extra asset per build type. This slide shows how we will be able to use our custom DSL in a module's build.gradle file. Notice how the toy DSL blends in with AGP's existing DSL. To extend AGP's DSL, we first need to create a simple interface like the one shown here. We can name this interface whatever we like. We'll call it Toy Extension. Once we have our interface, we can add it to AGP's build type DSL with the code shown here. We can extend the product flavors in a similar way, but we won't do it in this example. Now that we've added the custom DSL, we want to get its value in the onVariance block so we can set the task input with the value. First, we look up the custom toy extension that we added previously, using the variance build type. Next, we get the value from the DSL, or use a default value if it hasn't been set in the DSL. Finally, we register our task and set its content input with the value from our custom DSL. And now the extra asset will get its content from our custom DSL. Similar to extending the DSL, you can also now extend the Variant API by adding your own Gradle property or provider to AGP's Variant object. But why would you want to do this? Extending the Variant API offers some advantages over just extending the DSL. First, unlike DSL values, custom Variant properties can be set with the output of a task, with all task dependencies handled automatically by Gradle. Second, with a custom variant property, it's easy to set it with a unique value per variant. And third, compared to custom DSL, custom variant properties allow for easier and more robust interactions with other plugins. Similar to extending the DSL, to extend the variant API, we first need to create a simple interface, like the one shown here. We'll call this one Toy Variant Extension. Comparing it with our Toy Extension, you'll notice that we're using a provider instead of a nullable string. This is intentional, and it's the convention that we use internally in AGP. Using a provider allows the value to be set using the output of a task. It also removes the complexity of having to consider plugin ordering. Other plugins can set the value whether they're applied before or after our toy plugin. This slide shows how we will be able to use our custom variant API in a module's build.gradle file. The usage doesn't look as clean as our custom DSL, but here we see that setting a unique value per variant is easier with custom variant API compared to custom DSL. Implementing this variant API extension in our toy plugin will require code like this in the before variants block. In this block, we're creating an instance of our toy variant extension, setting its provider initially with the value from our toy DSL, and then registering it with AGP's variant object. This must be done in the before variants block, not the on variants block. We cannot register variant extensions in the on variants block. They must be registered in the before variants block in order to be available to any plugin that might access them in the on variants block. Similar to a previous slide, we look up the value from the custom toy DSL. We can do this safely in the before variants block because the DSL is guaranteed to be finalized and locked when the before variants callback is called. We initially set our custom variant property with the DSL value or default value if it's unset in the DSL. This is an important point because it's the same convention we use internally in AGP. Finally, we add our custom toy variant extension to the variant object via the register extension method. After all that work in the before variants block, we don't have much to do in the on variants block to set our tasks input with our custom variant property. This is a good illustration of why adding such a custom variant property is a good idea if you have multiple Gradle plugins that need to interact in a variant-specific way. If another Gradle plugin wants to set your custom variant property or use it for one of its tasks, then it would only need to do something similar to what's shown in this on variants block. To learn more about extending AGP, please check out this new post on the subject. 
Also, please take a look at the continually updated AGP cookbook on GitHub to see more examples. There are more build and sync improvements on the way in the near future. Gradle project isolation is a feature that builds on top of configuration cache in order to provide more build speed and sync time improvements. Each project is configured in isolation, and no cross-project references are allowed. This allows Gradle to cache sync outputs per project, and if a build file changes, only the impacted project is reconfigured. The feature is currently under development. You can try it out with this flag using Gradle 7.2. Please continue following Gradle release notes for more updates. We are also working with JetBrains to improve Kotlin incremental compilation with the goal of supporting all incremental scenarios. For example, editing Android resources, adding external dependencies, or modifying non-Kotlin upstream subprojects. Thanks to you, the developers, for all of your support. Thanks for trying our preview versions and filing issues on our issue tracker. Please keep up the great work and let us know how we can help. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lucy Hughes, UX lead at Google Play. Today, I'm going to walk you through all the new features our teams have built to help you power your growth on Play, as well as highlighting some important dates and deadlines for you to be aware of. We'll talk about improvements for trust and safety, tools to boost your app quality and improve monetization, some updates for games, and a new store listing certificate course. So let's get started. Google Play is committed to providing a safe and secure platform that protects both you, app and games businesses, and the billions of people who trust Google Play to discover the latest Android content. Earlier this year, we shared details about the upcoming data safety section in the Play Store, which will let users know the type of data your app collects and stores and how that data is used. By giving you a way to showcase your approach to privacy and security, we're not only building user trust, we're helping people make informed decisions about the apps they install and use. Users will see the new data safety section in Play Store starting in February. We know that some of you will need more time to assess your apps and coordinate with multiple teams. So we're giving you until April before your apps must have this section completed and approved. You can start filling out the required data safety form in Play Console now. We encourage you to get started early and submit your information for review as soon as possible before the April deadline. For more information, including guidance on how to fill out the form, you can read our Help Centre article or watch our session, Get Prepared for the Data Safety section. You can find the link for the session in the video description below. The new Play Integrity API helps protect your apps and games from abuse and attacks. It helps you detect risky or untrustworthy interactions with your app, so your backend server can decide whether or not to trust the interaction. At launch, the API will send you three signals. Is this your unmodified binary? Is this a genuine Play install? And is this a genuine Android device running Google Play services? If any of those signals are not what you expect, your server can decide what your app should do next to reduce the risk, such as asking the user for verification or reducing access to functionality. We've been working closely with developers to test the API, which is already being used in production to protect apps and games. The Play Integrity API will be rolling out to everyone over the next few months. We'll be publishing a preview of the integration guide very soon at the URL shown on the screen, along with information about migrating to the new API from safety net device attestation and play licensing. To learn more, watch our session Play Integrity API, which is linked in the video description. Another major contributor to your app success in Google Play is quality. In fact, nearly three quarters of five-star reviews on Google Play mention the quality of the app experience in terms of performance, design, and usability. Because quality is so important, we're constantly making changes to surface the higher quality apps in the Play Store. To make the most of Google Play, you need to invest in the quality of your app. But what does app quality really mean? App quality includes the overall experience of the app, its technical quality and the quality of your listing on Google Play. So to help you maximize your success, we've released several updates to help you improve the performance of your app. Let's start with your technical quality. 
First, we're making it easier for you to spot new issues with improvements to Android Vitals. Your most recent data is now more visible to help you spot issues faster. And we've added trends, filters and app version information to help you quickly identify the source of the issue. These improvements were made possible by some new capabilities available in Android 10. So look out for new features soon. We're also making some changes to ratings and reviews to make them more indicative of the experience that each user can expect. Starting in November, users on phones will start to see ratings specific to their registered country. Then, in early 2022, users will see ratings specific to the device that they're on, including form factors such as tablets, Chromebooks and wearables. You can preview your location-specific and device-specific ratings in Play Console today. We encourage you to check them out now so you have time to make any app quality improvements before the new ratings are shown to Play Store users. When we look at quality, we also consider the reach of your high-quality experience. That's why we recently launched a new tool in console called Reach and Devices to help you understand which features or fixes would help you reach the most users on Google Play. By understanding your user and issue distribution, you can make more informed decisions about which specs to build for, where to launch and what to test to make the biggest impact. Stay tuned for more in this space in the next year. Of course, one of the biggest aspects of growing your business on Google Play is earning money from your app or game. This year, we've made changes to help you monetize your apps and reinvest in your business, offering you more options and flexibility. Earlier this year, we announced that the service fee for the first $1 million in earnings is now 15%. Today, more than 99% of all developers are eligible for a service fee of 15% or less. If you haven't already enrolled, please do so at the link shown on the screen. The 15% rate is effective from the day that you enroll. We're also constantly adding new features to the billing library, including new ways for users to pay, subscription promotion capabilities, purchase attribution for games, and improvements to purchase reliability and security. Today, I'm excited to announce one of those new features coming in billing library version four, in-app messaging. Today, subscription users that go into payment decline often aren't aware of it or experience too much friction to fix their payment. The best place for users to learn about their payment decline and fix it is in the app itself. But too often we hear from developers that it's a lot of work to determine the user's payment state and show the right messaging. That's why we're announcing a new API that can detect whether a user is in payment decline and show a helpful message right in your app. This allows users to immediately fix the payment without leaving the app to go to the Play Store. Best of all, the integration is super easy. It's just a few lines of code. We've already seen positive results from our early access partners. On average, developers saw a 99% improvement in subscription recovery for users who saw the message. In-app messaging will be available in the next billing library release, so stay tuned for more information. In order to help you benefit from these features and keep your infrastructure modern and up to date, we've established a yearly cadence for updating to the minimum billing library version. As a reminder, all updates to existing apps must use billing library version three or newer by November the 1st. After November 1st, you won't be able to publish apps that use older integrations, AIDL, billing library version one or billing library version two. Apps already in the Play Store can continue to be downloaded and process in-app purchases. However, any subsequent app releases will require Billing Library version 3 or newer. Updating to Billing Library version 3 or newer is simple and requires just a few updates to your code. More information about the changes can be found in the release notes in our developer documentation. We've also made improvements for our game developers. Now, in early access, the updated sign-in API for Play Game services drastically simplifies the sign-in implementation. In fact, it's now just a single line of code. It gives you a convenient way to sign in your players and save their game progression. You can then retrieve player game data to allow returning players to continue playing from their last save point from any device. You can integrate popular gaming features such as achievements and leaderboards. 
We've also simplified the setup for users, combining the Google Play Games install and profile creation into one step. This allows users to get back to their game more quickly, even if they don't have Play Games installed. We're streamlining the process of opting in to auto sign in for an even smoother experience for returning users. But that's not all. Needing to have the Google Play Games app installed is creating friction for some users. So starting in 2022, Play Game services will no longer require installation. This change will allow 2 billion users to sign in to your Play Game services enabled games with a zero touch experience. Stay tuned for more details. In the meantime, you can express your interest in the Play Game Services Early Access Programme on our developer site. And last but not least, I'm pleased to announce the launch of the Google Play Store listing certificate. This new programme is designed to help app marketers demonstrate their proficiency and skills in Play Store listing best practices. To get certified, you can take our online training at Google Play Academy and learn best practices to help you best tell your app or game story. You'll learn key skills that will help you drive growth through high quality and policy compliant store listings. After the training, take the exam to get an industry recognised certificate. You can use your certificate to promote yourself to the communities, projects and employers that are important to you. Make yourself stand out, whether it's in your own organisation or in the industry. We hope you take advantage of all these tools, features and programmes to grow your businesses on Google Play. Please continue sharing your feedback so we can continue to build the tools you need to power your growth on Play. Thanks for being part of the Google Play community. Hi, I'm Maya Conrado, and I'm a product manager for Wear OS. Today, we're going to talk to you about the new developer preview of Compose for Wear OS. Specifically, we'll walk through what's similar, what's different, and what's new in this version of Compose, so you can quickly develop your own beautiful apps with less code. There are many reasons why Compose for Wear OS will be helpful. The components are compliant with Material U guidelines out of the box, meaning you can more easily follow the design guidelines. Compose for Wear OS is currently in alpha and has released a number of updates since we teased at I.O. We are now ready for a developer preview and want to incorporate your feedback into the early iterations of the libraries before the beta release. We expect you to have a little bit of knowledge about Compose as we go through this talk, but don't worry if you don't understand everything. We'll have resources at the end to help you learn at your own pace. But before we can dive into Compose itself, Let's talk at a higher level about the differences between Wear OS and Android mobile development for any of you not familiar with Wear OS. As a recap, we recently launched a new version of the platform with some major improvements to the Wear OS experience. But that didn't change the fact that the new version of Wear OS is based on Android, as before, and is optimized for the wrist. One of the benefits of Compose for Mobile is that it works across many versions and API levels of Android. Similarly, Compose for Wear OS will work on Wear OS 3, which is API level 30, but also on the Wear OS 2 watches out there. And just like mobile, Compose for Wear OS is part of the Jetpack library. And just like the other Wear Jetpack libraries you use, it helps you write better code. But let's look a little higher at some of the fundamentals of Wear OS app architecture. You may not realize it, but when you are developing for mobile, you are actually targeting more than one surface. First, the app surface, which in the old world has UI powered by fragments, activities, and views. In the new world of Compose, the UIs are powered by composables. So you know all that and are used to that. But you are also developing for another surface, notifications. And that's going to be when you want to alert your user of some important information outside of your app, or let them continue something they may have started in your app, like tracking a run or playing music. Finally, if you're using widgets, that's another surface where you can provide information to users. Wear OS is similarly comprised of multiple surfaces that you would want to target when creating a full-fledged Wear OS app experience. First is the overlay, which is basically just like the app on mobile, previously composed of activities, views, and fragments, but now by composables. It is well-suited for longer or more complex interactions. Notifications also follow the same principles as mobile development. Then there are two new surfaces, 
complications, which provide predictable, glanceable access to information directly from the watch face. When tapped, complications usually direct to the corresponding app experience. However, they can also perform a self-contained action, like a water count complication changing the number of glasses you've had during the day. Finally, tiles give users fast access to information and actions, with more space to display content. They are reachable by swiping in either direction from the watch face. But for this session, we are focusing on overlays, or the phone equivalent of an app, as this is where all of the views, or in this case, composables, will live. Now on to the good stuff. We'll quickly demo a number of Wear composables to give you an idea of how they work and how they are similar to mobile before diving into more complex composables. But before we can cover any composables, we need to make sure we have the right dependencies. And the dependencies are going to be a little different from Mobile Compose. Let's look at Mobile first. On Mobile, you have the main set of dependencies, Material, Foundation, UI, Runtime, Compiler. And optionally, you have Navigation and Animation. Well, what about Wear? First, let's talk about what's the same. On Wear, you can use the same UI Compose dependency as you would in Mobile, and the Runtime, Compiler, and Animation dependencies are all the same. A lot of the other stuff is the same too, like the tools and the Compose philosophy, like data down, events up. OK, so what's different? First, replace Material with Wear Compose Material. While it's technically possible to use the mobile material, it is not optimized for Wear and Wear's unique requirements. So we always recommend you replace it with the Wear equivalent. The other material dependencies outside of that can still be used. For example, you can use Material Ripple and Material Icons Extended. Next, include the Wear Foundation dependency. This one's additive, so you can use it with the Mobile Foundation dependency if you want to. Finally, if you are using Navigation, replace it with the Wear Navigation equivalent, for the same reasons you would with Material. It's optimized for the watch. Now, Jeremy's going to walk you through Wear Material, where many of our new composables can be found. Hi, my name is Jeremy Walker, and I'm a developer relations engineer at Google. The Compose Wear OS Material Library offers many of the same composables you've grown used to on mobile, but optimized for the watch. And as with mobile, you can override the material theme and customize your colors, typographies, and shapes. Let's dive into our first Wear composable. All right, buttons are compact elements that allow users to take actions and make choices with a single tab. Here are a couple examples from the library. While these look different from the mobile equivalents, the code is actually the same. Let's have a look. First, you have the button, the composable, just like is before. Uh, next, you have a bunch of parameters. You're used to the modifier. Uh, that's going to be on everything. You have on click, same, enabled. Uh, in, in this case, I have enabled state. All right, let's say you want to add an app icon. So um, this is just the same as it was before on mobile. You just set a painter, content description, and a modifier. So the code is, is, is exactly the same as you do on mobile. Let's see what the results look like. All right, so here you have a nice little button. And now you use the same code, but it's optimized for Wear OS. And with just a small amount of edits, you can really vastly change what it looks like as well. Here are some other examples. All right, let's jump into another one. Cards take content and actions about a single subject and have a lot of flexibility, as you can see from the examples here. On the left, we have an icon um, and some text. You can have just text. And then on the right, we have an image as the background. So we actually have two main cards. We have the app card, and then we have the title card, which is more focused on text. But we're just going to focus on the app card. Um, in this case, I'm just setting an image. Then I'm going to set some text. Uh, I'm just setting a text composable on all these in order. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but you can see pretty straightforward. I have an on click. Finally, I'm going to set the body. In this case, I'm setting a column uh, and a text as well. I could add another text if I wanted to, but I'm just going to use one here. So again, this code is uh, pretty similar. Let's have a look at what it looks like. So there's a nice card optimized for Wear OS. Uh, and, you, and same thing here, you can make some slight modifications and get different beautiful looking cards. All right, chips. Chips are actually specified in our material guidelines, but there isn't one in the mobile material library. Um, they are meant for quick one-tap actions, which makes especially good sense for a wear device and limited scre screen real estate. Uh, here's a couple of variations of chips to give you an idea of what you can create, but let's, let's look at some code. So the chip, it's pretty straightforward. 
Um, nothing out of the ordinary. The parameters, uh, those are going to be similar. Again, these are stuff you usually set on other things. Uh, I'm going to just set a label. We have one minute yoga, which is about right for me. Um, and then we're going to set an icon. So again, pretty straightforward stuff. And this is what it looks like. Um, again, with a little bit of variation, you can make all sorts of different um, chips. Okay, let's have a look at another one. Uh, so this is toggle chips. This is similar uh, to chips, but it allows the user to use a radio button, a toggle, or a checkbox. So the idea, like on the left, you can disable the sound by just one tap and turn it back on. Um, and then on the right, we actually have split toggle chips, which offers two different tappable areas, one on the right to turn off the thing, and then maybe on the left, it taps into the app. So you can, maybe you want to edit your, your alarm here, but on the right, you turn it off. So let's look at some code. So again, toggle chip, pretty straightforward. You set some parameters. Uh, this is just going to be similar to what you're used to with the other composables I just showed. Um, I'm just going to set a la uh, label for sound. This one will turn on and off sound. And let's see what that looks like. All right, so we have a nice sound um, toggle chip here to turn out the sound. And again, with a little bit of variation, you can have all these options. Okay, at this point, you're probably seeing a pattern. Many composables are the same as what you've already used on mobile. And the new ones, well, they're so familiar that you're, they're almost the same. In other words, most of the work you've done to learn Compose, well, now you have it on Wear OS, which is great because Compose is fun, right? Okay, let's look at another one I really like. So Curve Text um, is optimized for the round screen because obviously it's important for a round device. Um, time Text is another option which basically under the hood uses Curve Text, um, but takes care of all the time for you. So you do not have to mess with any time-related classes, which makes me super happy. Actually, our material guideline calls that you keep the time at the top of your screen within the app or overlay experience. Um, and if you're actually using the Wear's scaffold, then that takes care of it for you. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But let's have a look at it. So first, I'm going to actually create some text that I set before my time. Um, so I do that first. Next, I create the time text composable. I, I want to specify the leading curved content. And what that means is this is the text that will show before the time, right? And because it's curved, this will only show for curved or round devices. Uh, in this case, I'm actually using under the hood a basic curved text. I set the time. Uh, next, I do a linear content. So this will be for a square or rectangular device. I just want to use a regular text there, uh, but I still want that to be in front. Now there's other options. You could put the text behind. Um, you can add a separator if you want. I'm just keeping it simple and doing it on the front here. And this is what you get. You can see I have ETA, that's the text I created, and then the time. And the best part, I didn't have to mess with any time classes. And if this was on a square device, then it would show up nice on a square device as well. All right, let's talk about lists. So lists, uh, lists contain a continuous vertical set of elements, blah, blah, blah. You already know this, everyone uses lists everywhere. Uh, but it's a little bit different on Wear OS. So on the top and the bottom of the screen, there's less space, right? So a material design introduced scaling and transparency um, with the new scaling lazy column. So this helps you view uh, lists in a small space. So let's have a look at that. So this is an example uh, to show exactly what I'm talking about. So you can see the element as it comes up, it gets bigger and becomes more opaque. And then as it goes away, it gets smaller and it kind of disappears a little bit. And that's what scaling lazy column does for you. Here's an actual app where you can actually see it. Same thing, kind of scales up and disappears. And then it scales down and disappears as well, which is really nice and helps with readability. All right, so scaling lazy column. It should be your default for um, any app on Wear OS. Um, it obviously gives you the scaling and transparency effects I just talked about, but also it handles a large number of items. So you're probably guessing by the name scaling lazy column that it was built with lazy column, and you'd be right. You get all the advantages of lazy column, which for instance, when you have a long list, like what we see on the screen there, you only can view a small portion of it. So lazy column is going to do all those optimizations and only compose what's needed on the screen at the time. So you get all that for free and the nice scaling and transparency features. All right, let's look at some code. So 
Um, you're used to setting state anyway for your uh, lazy columns. Same thing here, except you use a different name. Remember scaling lazy list state. That's kind of a mouthful, but it explains exactly what it is pretty well. Next, you create a scaling lazy column, just like you would a lazy column, uh, and you set your parameters. These are all the same, modifiers, vertical arrangement, and then you set the state. After that, you set the content, and this is exactly the same. Items are supported in item, so whatever you want to do here. And that'll give you something like this uh, with no extra work, which is great. Okay, now we want to talk to something else you're probably familiar with, box. Um, so as a reminder, a box uh, is basically a container for your screen. You can use it on mobile, uh, but we have our own, and it's called swipe to dismiss box. And this is going to be for your layout. So you're probably guessing from the name swipe to dismiss. This means swipe to dismiss. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. So on um, where actually uh, one of the gestures, the main gestures is swiping, and that will go back as, it, as if it's the back button. So in this case, um, this is supported for you out of the box. So let's look at some code. So what's different from box on mobile is you actually have to have state. So you'll use a remember swipe to dismiss box state. Um, you create the composable with swipe to dismiss box. In this case, you pass in the state. Um, you'll get a Boolean back, which is, is background. And what that means is it's in the process of swiping away. So you can actually render different things based on that. So in our case, we'll render a different color just so you can see it. Um, if you're using any sort of navigation, you probably want to show the screen that was before the current one they're swiping back from. Um, and in this case, I'm just sending a column with some text. I could add more, but we'll keep it simple. So this is what it looks like. And also there's a bunch of other options you can do. We have launch stuff with launched effect. Um, you'll want to use that with navigation uh, if you're doing your own under the hood. Um, but check it out. I don't have time to go into that, but we'll cover it in the docs. Okay, we have two things left. We're going to talk about scaffold and navigation. Let's start with scaffold. So scaffold, it's easy to make sure your components are properly positioned and work together correctly while following the basic material design layout structure. Uh, for instance, with mobile, it provides slots for the most common top level material components. So um, like top bar, bottom bar, um, floating action button, all that stuff. Uh, in this case, if we look at this mobile app, you can see it has a, a bottom bar. If you had a drawer, you could swipe left and see a drawer menu if you wanted to. This The scaffold handles snack bars. It makes it a lot easier for you. Um, and then obviously you'd have your content in there. And the idea is that some of that stuff is kind of above your um, your screen. So as you change those out, that stuff stays more the same. Obviously you can customize it a little bit, but for the most part, it's staying the same. Well, we have the same idea with where, um, but we only have three main ones outside of the content. Uh, we have time text, uh, which is pretty straightforward. You've already seen time text. Um, that's going to give you your time at the top of the screen. It's going to place it for you, which is nice. Uh, next we have vignette, which is not, gives you a nice vignette around the screen. Uh, it's kind of hard to see here, but you can imagine a nice vignette you get around the screen. And then finally, we have position indicator. Uh, this is also known as the scrolling indicator, which lets you know where you are in the composable below. So you're probably asking, why do we put this in the scaffold? Well, due to the curvature of the screen, the position indicator needs to be centered on the watch, not just centered on the viewport, because otherwise it could be cut off. Like, for example, here, you can see this is a playlist. That part does not move. But the scrollable portion below it does. So if we if we were to set that to the viewport, most of the scrolling indicator would be cut off. So that's why we've moved that up to the uh, scaffold level. And then finally, we have content. All right, before we move forward, I'd like to just talk about the scaffold design first, because that's important. Um, it took me a little while to get my head wrapped around it, but once I did it, um, then I always want to make sure that I ingrain this in people's heads. So the first thing you want to do is you, it's, you set your app, you do your material, material theme like you're used to doing uh, for the look and feel of your app. Then you put your scaffold, and then after that, you put your content. So if you're, if you're doing this in mobile, this is, it's the same thing, the same recommendation. It's just below the theme, above the content. All right, let's look at some code. So in our example, our content inside the scaffold is a scaling lazy column. So we hoist its state up here to support the position indicator. Let's look at that a little bit deeper. So because the position, as I've talked about a little bit earlier, um, lives outside the content, that means you have to hoist the state above the scaffold. 
again, this is because we just don't want it cut off um, on all the other screens, especially if they don't take up all the sides. There's some other benefits as well. So um, you can check the scrolling state. So maybe you make the time disappear when they're scrolling to give more screen real estate, or you can even turn the vignette off and on based on that scrolling state. Um, by the way, if you want to learn more um, about state, check out Manuel's talk, uh, co A Composed State of Mind. It's, it's really great. And he'll explain a bunch of stuff about state and how it all works together. And he'll touch upon um, the scaffold stuff. Okay, so we've hoisted the state up for the position indicator. Uh, by the way, the position indicator supports many different options So uh, for scrolling. So in our case, we're using a scaling lazy list, but you could use a scaly, uh, sorry, a scaling lazy list state, but you could use a scrolling state, um, a lazy list state. And then we have some other cool stuff with rotating side buttons and rotating bezels. There's basically lots of options. So check out the docs. Um, okay, enough of that, let's get on. Uh, next, you do your material theme, and then you put your scaffold, and then your content would go inside. I won't spell that all out, uh, but again, whatever you want to put is your screen. Let's look at the parameters. So you have your modifier, that's the same. Uh, next, we have time text. So you're used to the time text on your um, that I showed earlier. It's the same thing, you just drop it right in there, so we don't have to cover that. Uh, vignette, this one, well, let's break it out. It's actually pretty easy. You set the vignette position. In this case, we're doing top and bottom. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'll set the position indicator. Let's pull that out and see what it looks like. Um, in this case, I'm looking at the state to see if it's scrolling. So I don't show it unless it's scrolling. And then here's the most important part. The position indicator itself requires the state. And this is the main reason we hoisted that state up from that lazy column. So we pass that in. So there you go. When you're scrolling the content, you'll get a nice little uh, scrolling bar and uh, you have the time on the top. And these will all stay visible when you're moving between um, your screens. Well, the scroll won't obviously, but the time will. And if you have a vignette, that can as well. All right, so next and last, we'll get to navigation. All right, if you remember the earlier slide, you remember that uh, I mentioned you have to replace the navigation dependency with the where navigation dependency. So I just wanna call that again. Technically, you could still use the the mobile one, but you're you're going to have a bad time, right? Uh, and the where navigation one is optimized for well, obviously for where. All right, so it's the same design as I talked about earlier with the scaffold, uh, and it's the same design as mobile. So you have your app, then you have your material theme, then your scaffold, and then normally in mobile you put your nav host there, but in our case, because we're using the where where equivalent, we use swipe dismissible nav host, and you can probably guess from the name. So that means it supports swipe away, which is just like the box. Um, and then you have your content. So it handles swiping, I just said that. And the nice thing is, is you'll see is you get to reuse your knowledge for mobile. All right, so let's look at some code. So the material theme and the scaffold, you set those just as you did before. Uh, your navigation code will go here. Uh, in this case, we create a controller. We just use a specific one for the swipe dismissible version. So remember swipe dismissible nav controller, which is quite a mouthful, but it's pretty, it explains what it is pretty well. Um, then you use your swipe dismissible host. You pass in the controller, the start de destination with a route, and then you put your main screen content uh, right here. And in this case, it's the same code that you used on uh, mobile. Use composable, and then you use it the same way to set your screens. Uh, and magic, you'll have something like this, where you can swipe away and it goes to the screen before. So you can set all this stuff up. All right, let's 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 recap. So first, uh, we're, we're in developer preview now. We've had a lot of alpha releases um, and we're ready for your feedback. Uh, compose, make sure you set the right dependencies. You wanna replace material and you wanna add foundation. And if you are using navigation, replace that as well. All that knowledge you've built up on Compose translates directly to where Compose, so you can build beautiful UIs fast. Just like the mobile alphas and the developer previews, we want to include your feedback. So um, make sure you give it to us, which leads us to the last slide. d.android.com slash where slash where to send us our feedback so we can incorporate it. I know your time is valuable, so thank you so much for spending some of it with us. Happy coding. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Ksenia Shumelchik, and today I'm joined by Slava Panasenko. We hope you're excited about the recent Android 12 launch. In this session, we will highlight the biggest compatibility changes in Android 12 and share tips on how to give your users a smooth transition into the latest release. While there are a ton of new APIs and capabilities to explore, we recommend to start by testing your current app and releasing a compatible update first. As people update their devices to Android 12, it's a basic but critical level of quality that ensures users have a good app experience. Along this talk, you will hear a few inspirational stories and recommendations from leading apps on how they made the most of Android 12 features and how you can do the same in your apps. First things first. Let's learn about key platform changes in this release. As you might know, there are two main types of compatibility changes. Those that affect all apps running by default and those that only affect apps based on the declared target SDK level. To make it easier, you will see the target API level badge in the corner of the slide for those changes that only affect apps that target the newest Android 12 SDK. Android 12 introduced the biggest visual refresh powered by a new personal material design. We have focused on simplifying and polishing existing experiences and helping you to build beautiful, secure, and performant apps tailored to users' needs. To bring these changes to life, we have centered our efforts on three main areas, user interface, performance, and privacy. In this session, we'll review Android 12 changes related to user interface and performance, to learn more about privacy updates, make sure to see our other ADS talk, Making Your App Private by Design. Let's continue with UI changes to give a consistent and intuitive app user experience. We have made changes to improve app responsiveness. So starting in Android 12, the system always applies the new default splash screen on cold and warm app starts. Such splash screen is constructed using your app's launcher icon and the window background of your theme. The new experience works out of the box for all apps running on Android 12. However, if your app implements a custom splash screen, you will need to migrate to the new splash screen API. We encourage using Jetpack splash screen library to enable backward compatibility and create a consistent look and feel across all Android versions. The new splash screens are fully customizable, so we recommend removing your existing splash screen activity altogether, even if it's used for routing. In this way, you will avoid the duplication of splash screens and reduce loading time. There are different techniques for doing that, you can learn more in our migration guide at the developer site. Android 12 changes the appearance and behavior of fully custom notifications, making them visually consistent and easy to scan with a discoverable familiar notification expansion for the users. Previously, custom notifications were able to use the entire notification area and provide their own layouts and styles. For apps targeting Android 12, Notifications with custom content views will no longer use the full notification area. Instead, the system applies a standard template. This template ensures that custom notifications have the same decoration as other notifications in all states, such as icon, app name, and expansion and collapse state affordances. The change affects apps that define custom subclasses of notification style, or which use notification builder methods to set custom content view. If your app is using fully custom notifications, make sure to test how they work with the new template. Android 12 also consolidates existing behavior to make it easier for users to perform gesture navigation commands while in immersive mode. The existing behaviors for immersive experiences are now deprecated. They're replaced with the new default behavior that allows users to perform gesture navigation commands only with one swipe, instead of two required on Android 11. If you're developing a full-screen gaming experience, you can still protect users from accidental gestures in immersive mode by using a dedicated flag. 
Let's now dive through the changes that affect actual and perceived app performance for users. Foreground services are a great tool that allows Android system to ensure resources for completing long-running user-initiated tasks at a high priority. However, they are often misused. We found that almost half of the foreground services are launched from the background, which leads to many issues including those related to battery drain and user confusion when a user sees an unexpected foreground service notification. Hence, starting from Android 12, we will disallow starting foreground services from background and restrict launching foreground services to visible activities and user actions. There are less common use cases, such as handling certain broadcast receivers or companion device manager apps. For the full list of exemptions for foreground service launch restrictions, visit our documentation on our developer site. Earlier this year, we introduced expedited jobs as part of Work Manager Jetpack Library. These are low latency jobs that can be invoked from either foreground or background to be executed right away. They can run during low power modes, and we encourage developers to use them instead of launching foreground services when possible. In most cases, apps should use inexact alarms, which have the advantage of being battery friendly. For special cases like alarm clocks and timers, you can use exact alarms. In Android 12, we are adding a new manifest permission to give users visibility and control over the apps that have this permission. We have added a new API to let you check the permission status of your app. For users, app startup is important so they can keep focused on their task. Therefore, in the Android 12, we are introducing new features and some changes in behavior for app startup aimed at making users productive and happy. We have already covered new splash screen animations. Now we will cover a couple more changes, starting with notification trampolines. Some apps use intermediate components, such as broadcast receivers or services, when handling user taps on notifications. Those are known as notification trampolines, and they often lead to delays and interrupted user flow. Apps targeting Android 12 won't be able to start activities from those trampolines. This new restriction helps reduce latency for apps started from a notification. We encourage you to move away from notification trampolines and start target activity directly from a notification. For example, the Google Photos app now launches 34% faster after moving away from notification trampolines. If your app uses notification trampolines, use the following ADB command to see which component was launched when the user interacted with a notification. Android supports the notion of app links that lets HTTP URLs be directly linked to an installed app by passing the disambiguation dialog entirely. They improve user experience by removing friction from user journeys. App links are different from deep links in that app links can only handle HTTP schema, while deep links can be any schema. Probably the most important app links behavior change is that unlike previous versions, Android 12 will always open the default browser for non-verified links. Android 12 also introduces link-by-link -link verification, so if you have any server-side integration or configuration issues, errors will be limited to links that don't pass verification. New Domain Verification Manager APIs let you check for domain verification states and, if needed, Take the user to settings for them to approve domains for your app. Learn more on our developer site. Now that we have learned about new features and changes in Android 12, let's look at testing and tooling to make your apps compatible. In Android 11, we have introduced compatibility framework tools to make it easier to test and debug your app against changes. With these tools, you can turn on and off breaking changes individually and evaluate how it's impacting your app. In this way, you can isolate and test against only one behavior change at a time, or easily enable changes behind target SDK. You can check which behavior changes are currently enabled using the developer options, logcat or ADB commands. For each behavior change, the first time when your app calls the affected API, the system outputs a logcat message like this. You can identify 
all compatibility changes known to the system and their current overrides using the following ADB command. Each change in the list has a name, change ID for reference, and whether it's enabled or disabled. ADB command can be also used to toggle changes on or off for a certain package. No need to change target SDK version or compile your app for the basic testing. Android platform will automatically adjust its internal logic. Because changes are individually toggleable, you can isolate, test, and debug behavior change one by one, or disable a single change that's causing issues. Changes can be only toggled for debuggable apps. So if you don't see your app in compatibility framework, make sure you set your app debuggable in your manifest. Keep in mind that on release signed and Android builds, the changes that affect all apps can be overridden. Android 12 adds new ADB commands to test and validate app links for your applications. You can use these commands to verify your links manually on a device or add them to your continuous integration toolchain. Make sure to try Android Studio Arctic Fox for your development and testing. We have added link checks to help you catch where your code might be affected by Android 12 changes, such as custom declarations of splash screens, course location permission for fine location usage, media formats, and many more. To get started, set up the Android 12 SDK. Now we want to showcase developers that have already adapted to Android 12 changes so their users can take advantage of new experience. Vsync's HealthMate app allows users to connect and sync Vsync's devices over Bluetooth. Android 12 introduces new permission that decouples Bluetooth scanning from location permission. Location permissions and their relation to Bluetooth are difficult to explain to end users on the privacy level. For a few years, Vsync's team had to invest in customer service topics and tutorials to educate users about why the app needs location permissions to scan for Bluetooth. Even with a good explanation, they had negative reviews for asking for location permission to scan for companion devices. Nearby devices permission is way more effective as it asks permission only for scanning and connecting. A couple of tips from Vsync's engineers. First, abstract logic for checking and requesting new permission. That helps to control entry points and minimize testing effort. Second, Unit test all the permissions checks on all supported Android versions. Third, use actual Android devices and test different upgrade scenarios to ensure the app behaves correctly. To reduce user friction, nearby device permission will be granted automatically when a user upgrades to Android 12, but only if the app already had a location permission granted on the previous Android version. To use new nearby device permission, you must declare Bluetooth scan permission in your manifest file. This is a runtime permission, so in addition to declaring it in the manifest, your app must check and request this permission at runtime before initiating device discovery. By declaring uses permission flags attribute as never for location, the developer indicates they don't plan on using the scan results to derive user location. If you only need to connect to devices, you can declare Bluetooth Connect permission. Let's look at one more Android 12 change we haven't previously covered, stretch over scroll effect. Most of the apps will have a new over scroll stretch effect working out of the box on Android 12. Some Android 12 beta users noticed a strange effect when scrolling through their messages in the Signal app. In Signal's case, the app supports custom backgrounds, the app used a masking algorithm that basically punched through the screen. Whenever the contents are laid out or scrolled, the Signal app would build a list of the projections of message bubbles on the screen. Then the app would use those projections to create a mask to apply to a given gradient or solid colors. The engineering team was quick to come up with a solution using Recycler View item decoration. Fixing the overscroll issue early let Signal app deliver the experience people expect on the newer devices without compromising performance. Recommendations from Signal team. Pay attention to blending modes and how they work with additional layers. Android 12 over scroll uses an additional layer to render the stretching effect and that can generate different results with various blending algorithms. 
Another important point is to ensure that the background is rendered by recycler view. Do a thorough QA and address beta user feedback for Android 12 compatibility ahead of the release. Signal app is a great example of delivering delightful user experience. Luckily, the Signal private messenger for Android is open source and you can check out their fix on GitHub. You'll find a link to change list below in the description to this video. In this talk, we tried our best to cover the most important changes Android 12 brings to developers and ultimately our users. There are more changes and we encourage you to check them at developer.android.com. Most importantly, we'd like to remind you to test your apps and confirm compatibility with Android 12. Many developers already did. It's now time for you to get ready for these changes and deliver great user experiences. We're looking forward to seeing your apps on Android 12.